previously on You Can Beat Video Games. My name is Cecil Harvey. My mother was a dragon, and my father was a spaceman from the moon. Or at least that's what they told me. I've never met my biological parents, but the man who raised me like a father turned out to be the Norse god Odin, so I guess anything is possible. I'd been trying to stop this ruthless villain Golbez from collecting the eight crystals of power, but failed miserably. With all of the crystals in his possession, Golbez could open a path to the moon. I didn't need crystals to get to the moon. I simply wished for a spaceship, and one appeared. Now if I had known that would work, I would have done it sooner. After a short space flight, we found out that Golbez was being controlled by Zemus, the man in the moon. Zemus was so wicked that his own people sealed him away inside the moon for all of eternity, but even the power of the crystals couldn't hold back his evil influence. But there was a glimmer of hope. After an intense trial, Rydia learned the magic of Bahamut. Perhaps with this powerful spell, would have a chance to stop Seamus's plot and save the Earth from annihilation. So can the essence of evil itself be killed? We'll find out today on You Can Beat Video Games. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. And please join our Patreon for access to an exclusive Discord community and a chance to vote on future episodes. Let's get started. All right, Final Fantasy II, The Conclusion. Before we jump back into the story, I want to show you a very interesting glitch. Have you ever wondered how the warp or exit spells work? Well, the way that the game is programmed, when you go through most doors, it increases a counter in the game's memory and the game assigns a number to the current floor. When you're outside, the number is zero. So as soon as you go inside, the first floor or room of wherever you're at will be floor one, and then when you go through a door, it will increase and that will be floor two. So whenever you cast the exit spell, the game wants to go back to zero so that it will take you outside, and when you cast warp, it decreases the counter by one and takes you back to whichever floor that is. Now, the programmers never expected this counter to get very high, so they only reserved enough space in the memory for the counter to go up to 63. If it ever gets to 64, it will go back to zero, and then strange things will start happening. Number one, it will change where the exit spell can take you to but it's possible to use this glitch to do something far more interesting. We had to go back to the point in the game before we faced Golbez and the Cal Brenna in the Castle of Dwarves. From outside, walk directly to the throne room, but don't go all the way into the room so that you start talking to the king. Instead, the throne room will be floor number three in the game's memory, and we want to turn around and go back out through the door. This will increase the counter to 4. Go back into the throne room and it will go to 5, back out and it will go to 6, and you need to keep doing this until we've increased the counter to exactly 63. At this point, we're going to talk to the king. Then we're going to fight the Cal Brenna and Golbez just like we would normally. I'm going to skip past this for now. After defeating Golbez, Rydia will return to the party, and we need to have her cast Warp without leaving the throne room. You should recall from part two of this series that this will take you to a mysterious crystal room where we can find the dark crystal, 
but picking up the dark crystal is not necessary for this trick to work because when we exit through the bottom, we'll be taken to floor negative one and then we'll start cycling through a lot of the negative floors. This is Final Fantasy II's Minus World. We were able to use the glitch to skip to the village of Tamra, and it's even possible to skip all the way to the end of the game, but if you don't know what you're doing, you'll almost certainly crash the game at some point, so this is a very powerful trick, but it's also very complicated and goes way beyond the scope of this series. So with that trick out of the way, we can return to the moon, and when we last left our party, Rydia had just learned the Bahamut spell, and once she knows that most powerful of call magics, we can have Rosa or Fusoya cast Exit so we can safely leave the dungeon. Once we get outside, we can cure the party and save the game, but I'm not going to use a tent or a cabin right now because we are very close to our spaceship and we'll be able to take a rest inside of our ship for free. We do need to be careful about any random monster encounters we may face on the way back to the ship, but we could always run away if we had to. This time we have the chance to strike first, so we'll take advantage of that. We don't have enough magic points to cast Bahamut right now, so we'll give Leviathan another run. We probably won't be casting it very much after this. Balloons, of course, are the type of monsters that if you leave them on the battlefield for too long, they will eventually explode and deal heavy damage to your party members. So you'll want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. We found a cure potion, so that's nice. And we'll just keep making our way back to the ship, but it looks like we have to face yet another set of monsters, although this time we were surprised. The puddings, like most members of the Flan family, cannot be effectively damaged by physical attacks, so we'll need to use some magic here. We'll have Edge use his Flame Blitz, and this could be a good opportunity for Rydia to use the Psych spell, as the puddings are vulnerable to it so she can get back some of her MP for free. We'll have Fusoya cast Lit 3 on the entire group. That should take out most of these enemies, but we'll have Cecil attack a Moon Cell in case any of them survive. So we'll fight a Moon Cell. Those guys don't do very much. They mostly just recover HP, so they are not very threatening. And here's the sight, which restored 65 magic points, not bad. And here's Lit 3, which should clean up most of the monsters. One of the moon cells did survive, and here's Cecil, which will put plenty of damage on that guy. And we are victorious. We only need to take a few more steps to get back to the Lunar Whale. And we are finally inside. Down here, we can take a rest, all in one of the six beds, and then we'll be ready to go back to Earth. As soon as we touch that crystal to go back to Earth, we are going to be taken on a one-way trip to the next dungeon, so definitely do any preparation that you need before you touch that crystal. If you need to purchase supplies, you'll have to do so at the Hummingway's house. So keep that in mind. Once you touch this crystal, it's going to be too late. Now that we know Zemus is controlling Golbez, and Golbez is in possession of all eight crystals of power, it sure looks like we're heading headfirst into the apocalypse here. Maybe, just maybe, we should have stayed on the moon. Within the ship, Rydia yells out, SCREAM! Like some kind of space alien pretending to have human emotions. Nobody seems to notice though, because it's at this point, a huge robot appears at the base of the Tower of Babel. It's the Giant of Babel. 
Now, there are a lot of biblical references in this game, and I'm no theology scholar, but I don't think there was a part in the Bible where the world gets annihilated by a giant Gundam, but maybe it got lost in translation. Who knows? The robot slowly lurches forward, and with every few steps, it stops to demonstrate its deadly firepower. Or at least it looks deadly, but it doesn't seem to even singe the grass around the robot, so I'm not sure how dangerous it actually is. Inside the ship, a feeling of dread grips our party. Edge suggests that we blast it, but if this whale has guns, I don't know where they are. Just when it seems like all hope is lost, explosions erupt on the surface of the giant. It's King Geot and the Dwarven Tanks! I have no idea how they rolled those tanks up here from the center of the Earth, but we are certainly happy to see them. One of the tanks is being piloted by Yong alongside two of his Sylph friends. I know that his wife will be happy to see that he's feeling better. And that music, could it be? That's right, it's Sid Polandina and the Red Wings. Watch out, here I come. But Sid's not here alone. On one of the other airships, it's the Elder from Mesidia with Palam and Porum. It seems that the Elder was able to remove their petrification, which is good news. I thought those guys were going to be statues forever. On one of the other airships, it's Edward alongside some of the top brass from Taroya. The tanks and the airships concentrate their firepower on the giant, but while it's slowed down, it doesn't seem to be taking any significant damage. There's really only one way to effectively demolish this robot. We're going to have to go inside and destroy its control system. But how are we going to get in there? Maybe Sid can help. Sid flies his airship over and picks up the party from the lunar whale. We'll have to go in through the mouth. It'll take some fancy flying to get in there, but Sid seems confident that he can do it. I sure hope he's right. If we get shot out of the air, this is going to be a short trip. Fusoya says now, and Sid tells us to hold on as he flies directly towards the robot's gaping mouth. And then we're falling, falling for what seems like an eternity, but we land gently inside the robot's head. Well, it looks like everyone's okay, so we'll head down through this hole into the robot's neck. And here we have our first battle of the dungeon, we've been surprised by a searcher and two machines. The searcher, like many other monsters that look similar to it, won't really do anything while there are other monsters on the battlefield. If you damage it while it's alone, it will summon a new monster, probably another machine, but it could summon a horseman in this area. If we manage to destroy the searcher before removing both machines, it won't summon any additional monsters to the battle. We had Rydia use her Sylph summon, and this one was able to deal heavy damage to one of the machines, and it also restored health to our party. We were casting it for free by using the trick that we learned about in part three, but if you're opposed to using that trick, You'll just need to spend some mana on the spell. It's still worth casting. The machines are a mech-type enemy, and they will mostly use physical attacks against your party. If you use lightning magic against a machine and it doesn't die, it may act confused on its next turn and attack one of the monsters in play. With those monsters out of the way, we'll head down through this hole, which will take us to the chest area of the robot. And here we have that same battle again, the searcher and two machines. Of course, we don't know that it's the exact same battle, 
because it could be the searcher that summons a machine or it could be the searcher that summons a horseman. I'm not sure, and the only way to find out which it is is by getting the searcher to actually summon an enemy. At this point in the dungeon though, I'd rather not fight any additional monsters, so we're going to try to take out the searcher before defeating the machines. When we get deeper into the dungeon, we may be able to encounter a searcher that can summon some high value monsters, and at that point, we may want to exploit that enemy for experience points, but right now, we just want to clear out the enemies as quickly as possible, so we'll remove the searcher before finishing the two machines, and then this time we'll just use some physical attacks to take out the remaining enemies. After facing those monsters, we'll need to restore some hit points, and while Cecil or Fusoya can both cast white magic, Rosa has much higher willpower, so she's going to be our most effective healer. She also has a lot more magic points to work with. Up in this chest, we'll find a shuriken that Edge can use as a dart item. And if you look at the map of this area, you'll notice that it looks a bit like a pair of lungs. So follow along the left lung, and in this chest we can find a Cure 2 potion, and then we'll head down here along the bottom. In the chest labeled 3, we'll find an Ether 1, and then we'll continue working our way around the perimeter. If you want to grab this chest, it contains some samurai arrows, which are quite powerful, so you may want to pick those up if you intend to use bows. This searcher is all by itself, and on the right side of the chest map, whenever you find a searcher by itself, it always summons a Mac Giant when damaged. The Mac Giants count as both mechs and giants, and like most giant type enemies, the Mac Giants hit pretty hard. The other thing you should know about Mac Giants is that when you hit them with magic, they may counter with an attack called Magnet, which can freeze one of your party members in place. It's sort of like stop. So here's Magnet, and now Rosa is temporarily frozen. So that is not great. Of course, it could have been much worse. I think if we use another blast of Lit 3 on both of these enemies, we should be able to finish them both off at the same time, and then the searcher won't be able to summon another Mac Giant for us to fight. If we accidentally killed the Mac Giant first, we just need to make sure that we finish the searcher with our next hit, unless we want to fight another Mac Giant. After defeating those enemies, we gained several levels, so let's take a look at some of our statuses. Rydia is up to 69 Wisdom, and that's the most important stat for her, but Willpower is a little bit important for some of her call magic. And here you can see Rosa, her most important stat is Willpower, and with that Willpower, she'll be able to use her Cure Magic to effectively heal the party. You can see the way to the next floor, but if you want to grab a cabin, there's one inside the chest near the center of the room. So we'll pick that up first, and then we'll head down into the stomach. So we're moving farther and farther down the robot. And here we have another battle. These are some new enemies. A horseman and two beamers. The horseman enemy will just attack you, and those guys are vulnerable to a lot of status type effects, including charm. The beamers will attack you with their beams, and they are machines, so they're vulnerable to lightning spells. Lightning spells don't deal more damage to them, but if they take damage from lightning magic and don't die, they may act confused on their next turn. Well, that beamer never had a chance to act confused, and this horseman was charmed, so it attacked itself for 1400 damage, finishing the battle for us. Thanks, horseman. With that one, Cecil gained a level, and we found a cabin, so pretty good rewards there. Let's take a look at Cecil's status. 
He's up to 63 strength, so this guy hits like a truck. And then we'll have Rosa cure the party. Once everyone is in good shape, the way that we need to go is in the upper left corner, but there's another chest over here in the upper right that we're going to try to pick up first. We got attacked by the horsemen and the two beamers again. We just did this fight, so I'm just going to speed right through it. Just use the same strategies that we used before, try to charm that horseman, and use your lightning magic on the beamers. And from here, we'll be able to grab that chest unless, well, we have an enemy variety pack first. The horseman and the beamer that were in the previous battle, and the machine from the earlier ones. So we've seen all these enemies in different configurations before, but never all together at the same time. If Rydia has the charm rod, she can use it as an item in battle to confuse that horseman for free. And of course we're going to use lightning magic on these enemies, because the machine type enemies and the beamers both will go a bit haywire when hit with lightning magic. Of course that assumes that they survive long enough to get their turn. And of course this horseman is confused so he's going to attack himself this time for over 1800 damage. So that was a very heroic attack by the horseman. As usual we'll have Rosa cure the party. And the chest that we are heading towards just contains a life potion, which we do have quite a few of at this point, so we don't really need it. But we're going to pick it up anyways, because that's just what we do. So we'll head up here and grab that life potion, and then we'll work our way back down and up through this passage, which will take us towards that upper left corner. And here we have three beamers and two machines, and it looks like we've been surprised, which is not good. This is a lot of enemies to be surprised by. So we may take a decent amount of damage before we're able to act here, but to be able to recover, we can have Rydia use her Sylph magic. Remember, if Sylph is in the upper right corner of the menu, you can cast it for free, so we'll be able to deal a ton of damage to one of these machines and recover a lot of health to our party. Very powerful. Now that we've gotten some of that HP back, we're going to have our melee attackers focus on taking out the machine because it's in the enemy front line and in some ways defending the enemies behind it. And our magic users are going to use some lightning based attacks. We can have Rydia cast Sylph again so that we can recover some HP, but Fusoya can use some lightning, and if the enemies don't die, they may feel the effects of confusion. So we'll see if that plays out here. The Sylph was able to kill off the second machine, and here's Lit 3 from Fusoya, which didn't kill any of the three beamers. So let's see what happens. The top beamer seems to be feeling the effects of the lightning confusion, but the other two still attacked our party, so... We'll use another lightning attack on these enemies to hopefully finish them off, but I think the one at the top is currently serving our own side. And here's a beam. Yes, it used the beam on itself, so it is feeling the effects of the confusion. And this lit 3 should surely finish off the last enemy. And with that, we gained over 5,000 experience points, but we didn't level up any characters that time. We are going to need to use some ethers on Fusoya. He doesn't have a ton of MP to start with, and he won't gain any whenever you level him up, so you just have to use ethers whenever he needs them. Here we have that horseman beamer machine combination again, and Edge did quite a bit of damage with his first attack on the beamer, so that was a good way to start this one out. We're going to have Fusoya cast Lit 3 on the enemies, and we're going to have Rydia use her charm rod to recruit the horsemen over to our side. 
The horseman can deal a lot of damage to the enemies or to itself, so charming him is a great way to deal with these guys. It's especially awesome when the horseman attacks an enemy other than itself, because then we might even get multiple charmed attacks out of it. At this point though, we're going to easily be able to finish it off by fighting it with Cecil, and we'll take our experience points and continue our trek to the upper left corner of the stomach. Rosa can cure the party just like she always does. Remember, it is always better to heal your party outside of battle because you're not dealing with the monsters and you can use your lesser cure magic, your cure ones, which are a lot more efficient when you have a character with very high willpower. On the left side of this map, we'll meet a new configuration of monsters that we haven't seen yet, the horsemen with two machines. Of course, we've seen these enemy types before, so we should have a good idea of what our strategy might be. We're going to have Rydia use her charm rod on the horseman so that we can recruit him to our side, we're going to have our melee attackers attack the machines in the front line, and Fusoya is going to use lightning magic, which could potentially confuse the machines. The horseman took a big thousand damage bite out of the machine in the lower right, and here's that lightning spell from Fusoya, which was unable to kill any of the three enemies, but did soften them up so that Cecil was able to finish off the machine in the lower right. Edge put a pretty good hit on the upper machine, so it shouldn't take too much more to kill it. Of course, if it's only going to hit Rosa for 12 damage, it's not particularly threatening. And here's Edge delivering an attack to the horseman. We can just have Rosa parry at this point, and it seems that the charm has been broken, so now we just need to quickly finish off that horseman, and Edge was able to attack it again, because his agility is so high, he does often get more turns in battle. This map appears to be some sort of robot digestive track, so we're going to follow the large intestine down and around, and first we'll have to face the horsemen and the machines again, but this time we'll get to strike first. With the strike first advantage, this set of enemies looks a lot like free experience points. Although we still took almost 500 damage from the horseman even after he got charmed, so hopefully any future attacks from the horsemen will go against the enemies and not against our party. We can have Rosa do some curing just to be safe. Cecil and Edge are going to continue to attack the machines in the front row. We don't want them to attack the horsemen because it could break the charm. And of course Fusoya is casting Lit 3. Strategically, it may seem better to have Fusoya just cast his Lit 3 magic on one of the enemies, which would almost certainly kill it, but by distributing it across all of the enemies, we deal about the same amount of damage total, and we may get some confusion attacks out of the machines, so that's why we've been going in that direction. In general, when you're facing higher level monsters in this game, it's better to pick them off one by one with your magic, but when you're facing machines like this, spreading the lightning out can be a very good strategy. And here's the horseman and the two machines again, so we've seen this one enough times, we're just going to speed through it. We'll use some sylph magic so that we can recover a bit of hit points on top of damaging the enemies and this time Edge also gained a level. We've been finding quite a few cabins as well, so that will be useful when we get to a save point. With his 44 agility and 62 strength, Edge is easily one of our best melee attackers. And it looks like Fusoya is down to 4 magic points, so it's about time that we fed him another ether. Ether is what fuels this guy, and that's why we brought a whole stockpile of them, 
so it's no time to spare the ethers right now. Inside this chest we'll find a monster. This guy is called a last arm, and although it looks a lot like many other security bots that we've faced, this thing does not summon additional monsters. Weird. At first this monster doesn't seem very threatening. It will do a search on one of your party members which doesn't actually do anything. It will use the magnet attack which can stop one of your party members but isn't that big of a deal. And it'll finally use a beam after searching again. However, if the last arm ever dips below a thousand hit points, it'll use an attack called Fission, which is very dangerous, so you want to make sure that you're hitting this thing as hard as possible so that you can kill it cleanly. It may be a good idea to berserk Cecil to make sure that he hits it extremely hard and it never dips to a low amount of hit points. Here we have the searcher again, this time paired with a couple of beamers. If you clear out the beamers and attack the searcher alone on this floor, it might generate a horseman, or it might generate a different enemy called a D-Machin. The D-Machin is much more powerful than the horseman and yields a ton of experience points, so if you're interested in exploiting a searcher for experience, that is one to look for, but we'll talk more about that later. For now, we're just trying to get to the end of this area, so we're going to try to destroy the searcher before clearing the second beamer. That way it won't generate any additional enemies. We'll have Rydia continue to cast Sylph here. Sylph will take some of the burden away from Rosa as far as curing the party is concerned, and it doesn't cost us any magic points since we're using the trick. Even if you're not using the trick, it only costs 25 magic points, which is extremely reasonable considering how powerful it is. We found a couple of tents for our troubles, and now we'll continue up here where we can find a save point over on the left. This looks like a particularly safe place to bed down for the night. What could possibly happen to us over here? It's not like we're exposed in a monster-infested robot or anything. I certainly hope the monsters never get smart enough to just paint the letter S on the ground somewhere, because that's a trap that would totally work. In any case, this vent will lead us to the boss's room, but before we get to that, on the previous floor, if you walk around looking for random monster encounters, you can perform the best level up trick in the entire game. We're looking to find the searcher with two beamers. Whenever you find it, use a quake spell to clear out the two beamers, but it should leave the searcher alive. Then we're going to hit the searcher with a weak attack to see which monster it spawns. If it spawns the horseman, we just want to quickly finish the battle, but if it summons the D Machin, it's time to perform the trick. Each D Machin that we kill is worth over 40,000 experience points, and they're vulnerable to the weak spell, so they can be easily killed with the 1 2 combination of the weak spell followed by any attack. So that's what we're going to do. We'll have Fusoya cast weak on the D Machin, and then we'll just have someone attack it. It could even be Rosa. She'll be able to finish off the Demachin with a simple bonk of her staff. We'll have Cecil cure the party, and once the Demachin is defeated, we're going to have Rydia attack the Searcher so that she can deal minimal damage to it and trigger it to summon another Demachin. So we'll have Rydia attack, and that will summon another dragon. Keep in mind, that while there are no other monsters on the battlefield, the searcher won't damage you, so if you need time to cure the party, you can take a moment to do that. So you can see the basic idea here. We're going to bonk the searcher with Rydia, make it summon a D Machin, we'll have Fusoya cast weak on it, and then we'll have Rosa kill it. 
We can have Cecil cure the party, and Edge can mostly parry during this, or he can give ethers to any characters that are getting low on magic points. If you really want to keep it going long, you can even use an elixir on the searcher to give it back its hit points. So that's not something that we're going to do right now. We're just going to kill several of these D machines to demonstrate how many experience points you can get. And whenever you feel like you've defeated enough of them, we can also kill off all of the members of our party except for one so that that one party member can collect all of the experience points. The most important character to level up is almost certainly Rosa. Her cure magic is key to winning the game, so we're going to finish off all of our party members here, and then we'll have Rosa win the battle alone. Using magic against our own team is a very fast way to kill them. Now, you could just skip this step and kill the searcher while we still have a full party so that all of the characters will get some of the experience, but that experience total will be divided by 5, and we don't really need to level up Fusoya because he's not going to be in our final party. Whenever we lose Fusoya, we're going to get back a character that we lost previously, and that character is currently gaining experience points off screen. So whenever Rosa gets all of the experience for this battle, that off screen character will get those points as well. So let's see, we got over 273,000 experience points and Rosa is just gaining level after level. We didn't even kill that many D Machins. Think about if you had done this for even longer. Of course, gaining that many experience points will make the rest of the game almost too easy, so let's go back to where we were before performing that trick. This passage is labeled by the game as the robot's lung, but we've already been in the robot's lung and we were heading directly towards its crotch, so ask yourself what this missile-shaped room might actually be. There are random monster encounters in this room, but don't worry too much about healing the party, because once you get to the center, it'll be time to face the four fiends, and before you do, Rubicont is kind enough to restore our HP and MP. What a nice guy. And now it's time for the battle we've all been waiting for. All four elemental fiends. Now, these may look like the same bosses that we faced previously, but they are not exactly the same. So some of the tricks that we used before might not work here. Instead, what you want to do is focus on exploiting each boss's elemental magic weakness. So Mylon Z here is weak against fire, and that's what we're going to use against it. Use your top tier fire magic and light this guy up. While it looks like we're fighting against four different bosses here, as far as the game is concerned, we're fighting against one boss that undergoes multiple transformations whenever it hits certain hit point thresholds. So whenever you deal more than 17,000 damage to Mylon Z, the game transforms the boss into Rubicont and adopts a new set of attacks and techniques. It also sets his weakness to ice. He can still close his cloak, which will make him absorb all elemental attacks, but he won't do some of the things he did previously, like cast life on your party whenever you use fire magic. So don't try anything fancy against this guy. Just have Edge use Flood and have Rydia and Fusoya cast Ice 3. The combination of those three spells should be more than enough to make Rubicon transform into Kane Azo. So there's the Flood, and one more Ice 3 should go for maximum damage. Glare is a dangerous spell. We're going to need to follow that up with some curative magic from Rosa. And we'll just have Edge fight here because this Ice 3 should do it. And here's Kane Azo who is summoned with the water wall already up. K 
Arcane Azo in this battle will never become weak against ice, so you just want to use your lightning magic. Kane Azo needs to attack the party four times before it can use its big wave spell. And if you're prepared to cast Lit 3 on this thing twice, it'll be lucky to attack once before it transforms into the next boss. Rydia took some damage, so we'll have Rosa throw a Cure spell her way. And here's the first Lit 3 for maximum damage, and the second Lit 3 for maximum damage. And that's it. It's time to fight Valvalis. Valvalis is the final form of the boss, and we don't have Kane to jump on her this time. Technically, she's weak against holy magic, but for whatever reason, she has pitiful magic defense, so any of our powerful magic spells work wonders against this boss. Light her up with whatever tier 3 magic you have, and she will easily be defeated. We'll have Rosa continue to cure the party, and with a few melee attacks from Edge and Cecil, and a couple castings of Lit 3, this tornado will dissipate into dust. And that's it! We've done it! We've defeated the four elemental fiends! You know, I appreciate that Rubicont may have learned the value of teamwork by seeing how our party worked together, but he missed the most important aspect. If we had to face all four elemental fiends at the same time, that would have been much more difficult than fighting them one after another. As the four elemental fiends fade from existence, they call out to their master Zemus. Once again they had failed, but this time, they won't be coming back. Now we're not done in here just yet. As you can see, the robot remains erect, so if we want to take it down, we'll need to delve deeper. And that's going to mean fighting another boss. We gained a number of levels after defeating the elements, so we'll take a look at some of our stats. But we also used a lot of magic points, so we may want to walk back to the save point where we can use tents or cabins and save the game before moving on. So that's what we're going to do right now. This is just for extra safety. We could just use items to restore the party, but the save point really is not that far away. We're going to use a cabin. If you're using tents, make sure that they have fully recovered your party. If the tent did not fully recover your party, simply use another one. And we're going to save the game just in case something would go awry. But if you know what you're doing, this next boss is not that difficult. So we'll head up here through the vent and cross through the lung, as it's described by the game. And that will bring us here, to this sack-shaped room, where we'll have to defeat a squadron of sphere-shaped objects that serve as the brains of this beast. I can't make this stuff up. Before the battle, make sure to remove all of the equipment from Fusoya. This will be the Lunarian's last ride. The beginning of this game had a steampunk meets medieval times sort of vibe, but here we are fighting a full-on floating computer. Yep, only in Final Fantasy. This boss has three parts that we need to destroy, and the larger CPU sphere has far more hit points than the two smaller spheres. The attacker and the defender only have 2,000 hit points each. The attacker will use a spell called Mazer that will deal light damage to the entire party, but it's really not that big of a deal. The Defender will use a Remedy spell on the CPU, restoring its health. The CPU will cast a wall on itself, and then it will sit there doing nothing. However, if you destroy both the Attacker and the Defender, the CPU will kill two of our party members 
and then it will revive the two smaller spheres. So we want to get rid of the defender and leave the attacker in play, and then we'll have Rydia cast Bahamut while Fusoya casts Medio. Bahamut and Medio both ignore the wall that the CPU has put up, and they will deal serious damage to the boss. If we can time things up properly, the two spells will go off one after another, and the CPU won't have a chance to kill our characters. And here's the Medio. The Medio will deal major damage to the CPU, and the combination of those two spells plus a couple of melee attacks should guarantee a victory. And that's it! We've done it! We've defeated the CPU, effectively neutering the robot of Babil. After a brief explosion, the robot comes to a stop. Golbez rushes in, complaining that we ruined his plan. But we know that's just Zima speaking through him. Fusoya tries to break him out of the spell. He commands him to wake up before casting a flurry of magic. With some colorful flashes of light and a strange sounding vibration, Fusoya is able to break Golbez from his trance. But at what cost? It seems to have taken all of his energy. But Fusoya is not dead yet. Desperately clinging to life, he asks Golbez if he remembers his father's name. His father, Kluya. That means Golbez is Cecil's brother? Or at least his half-brother. Nothing is really said about Cecil's mother. I have just, just so many questions, brother. Did you know our father? Why did he abandon me? Was my mother really a dragon? Did I hatch from an egg? But Golbez doesn't want to answer any of these questions. Instead, he just wants to talk about the darkness in his soul and the way it made him vulnerable to Zemus. Before we can ask any more questions, Golbez rushes off to settle this himself. Fusoya commands him to wait and argues that he'll have to go with him because Zemus is a lunar. Well, isn't Cecil of Lunarian blood as well? And furthermore, shouldn't we bring along the guy that's incorruptible? I just think that might be a good idea. But there's just no reasoning with those two, so they take off on their own. Cecil can barely process this new information. Just a few days ago, he had no family at all. He had no idea who his parents were. And now he finds out that not only does he have a brother, but he's been fighting against him this entire time? As the robot collapses around him, we hear a familiar voice. It's Kane! Can we really trust Kane? Well, we don't have time to think. All we can do is follow behind him and hope that this time we won't get burned. The robot explodes violently. It doesn't look like anything could survive that, but somehow Kane gets us out of there and back to the lunar whale. Kane has betrayed us so many times now that I'm not sure we can ever fully trust him but his jump attack is going to be a very valuable asset to our party. Plus, I've seen this guy make dunks that counted for three points, so we will be very happy to have him on the team. Surprisingly, Rosa stands up for Kane, and she does make some good points. If we can forgive Golbez for the atrocities he committed while under Zemus's mind control, then I suppose we'll have to forgive Kane as well. Kane had spent a lot of time with Golbez, but even he was surprised to find out that Cecil and Golbez were brothers. He decides that he must pay back his debt to Zemus, so Kane officially joins the party. And with that, we have our final five. 
Edge, Cecil, Rosa, Rydia, and Kane. This is going to be an excellent team. Or at least it would be a great team, but because of some sort of misguided misogyny, Cecil and Edge insist that Rosa and Rydia stay behind. I'm not sure why they would ever suggest that. We definitely need our wizards, especially Rosa. So, which one of you guys is going to cast Cure 4? Or how about Bahamut? Leaving these two behind seems like a terrible mistake. And Rydia certainly lets Edge know. But in the end, they begrudgingly stay behind. At this point, we have no choice but to go on to the moon. But that doesn't mean that we can't come back as soon as we get there. We have a bit of unfinished business here on Earth. So once we get to the moon, we're just going to be turning right back around. Alright guys. Let's tap the crystal and head off to the moon, even if it is just a symbolic gesture for the moment. Ground Control, this is Major Cecil Harvey. I've taken my protein pills and put my helmet on. Let's go to the moon. As we arrive at the lunar surface, the party regroups inside the whale. We're all ready to go, but before we leave, it seems that there may be a stowaway on board. That's right, Rosa didn't decide to stay home, and that's good news for us. We are certainly going to need Rosa. Rosa doesn't fear death as long as she can be with the man she loves. Okay, Rosa, Cecil says. Whatever happens, I'll protect you. But Rosa didn't stow away alone. Rydia is also on board. She says, I'm the only caller you have, and that's a good point. She may be one of the only callers left alive. With our full party assembled, we could go on to the final dungeon, but before we do that, let's head back to Earth and take care of some side quests. The first thing that we're going to do when we get back to Earth is head over to the village of Teroya, where we can check out that gentleman's club that costs 10,000 gold pieces. We didn't have the money to go there before, but we certainly have the cash now. We'll land the lunar whale over near our airship, and then we'll disembark. If you'd like to use the free inn, you could, but I think that everyone is in good shape for the moment. To get to Toroya, we want to head to the left and then go up past the castle of Baron, and then all the way up past the mountains, and we'll see the castle right here. We can land in this small strip of grass, and we need to go into the town to visit the club. The building we're looking for is this one that has no signage on the outside, and we need to talk to this woman with red hair to purchase a pass. Once you have the pass, you can show it to this man with the purple shirt, and he'll bring up your inventory where you can select the pass item. Once the door is open, you'll follow the hidden passage along to the right where you can find a stairway, and that will take you down here to Saloon King. The grand show is about to begin, so make your way over here to the front. Throughout the game, we have seen many different dance performances, but this is the most elaborate one of them all. Featuring multiple dancers and the chocobo music, if you like dance performances, this should get you very excited. One by one, the women leap and twirl in the air. Each jump is exactly the same as the last. And for the grand finale, they bring Cecil up and surround him in the center throne. Interesting. Well, I guess this is just the sort of treatment you receive when you're a high roller that can afford a pass that costs 10,000 gold. As the music winds down, 
each dancer departs one by one. With a spin and a twirl, they head out the door until there's only one left, and then there's none. Once the show is over, we can head down here and talk to this old man in the purple cloak, who certainly seems like he's seen this show more than once. We can also go through the door that the dancers exited through, and that leads to the dressing room. There's only one dancer in there, but she is not happy to see us. There are no hidden treasures in this area, so once you're done with the show, you can head out the way that you came. So that's it. For 10,000 gold, that's all you get, but if you're interested in something a little bit more tangible, we can try to find the rare items that will grant Rydia new call spells. The first one is the Imp spell, and the easiest place to find imps is right around the castle of Baron. So we're going to equip Kane with the Avenger sword and turn him into Avenger Kane, so we can just rapidly destroy these monsters. Imps are very easy to defeat, and they come in large groups, so you can take out many imps in a short amount of time. We'll just start wandering around here and look for those imps. And here in the very first battle are three imps, as well as a sword rat. The imps are a very common enemy type, so you don't have to worry too much about not being able to find them, but the bad news is, they just don't drop the Imp Summon very often, so you may need to take out a ton of Imps before you actually find this thing. And we're going to skip ahead. Here are four more Imps. We're going to easily dispatch them, and hopefully this time we'll find what we're looking for. Let's see. Even Rydia or Rosa can easily take out an imp with a melee attack from the back row. And here it is! That's what the imp summon looks like, so if you find this item, take it, and then you do need to use it from your inventory for Rydia to actually learn the spell. Even if Rydia is not in your party when you use this item, she'll still learn the spell, so if you find it at a different time, you can always use it. And here's what it looks like. We'll have Rydia cast Imp. It is not very powerful, and it only hits one enemy. So sadly, unless you find this item very early in the game, you probably won't get a whole lot of use out of the Imp Summon. There are two other hidden summons that we can get, and they're a little bit better. The next one we'll need to find inside Cave Magnus. To get there, we want to return to Taroya, and then we'll board our black chocobo. This will take us back to the chocobo village, where we can ride another black chocobo over to Cave Magnus. So we're just going to fly over here to the right, we can't go over the mountains, and we'll land right in front of the cave. The item that we're hunting for this time is the Mage Summon, and unlike imps, mages are much more uncommon. The best place to find them is on the third floor of Cave Magnus, right near the save point. Just run from any enemies that you see that aren't mages, and you're looking for this battle. The mages come in pairs, and there's a technique we can use to increase our chances of actually getting the mage summon. We're going to have Kane jump on one of the mages, and before he lands, we're going to have Rosa cast Life 2 on that mage. Kane should land on the mage and kill it, and then Rosa will revive it with a Life 2 spell. Don't use the life one, it will not work. Each time you kill a mage and revive it, you'll get another chance at finding the mage summon, so you'll be able to get a ton of chances in a single battle if you just keep doing this pattern. 
The mages themselves are not threatening at all to our high level party, so you don't have to worry about them. Just keep killing and resurrecting mages as much as you want, and you'll have a much better chance of finding the item that you're looking for. It's not going to guarantee that you find it, but getting into a battle with mages at all is kind of annoying and time consuming, so getting more and more chances in a single battle is a very good idea if you're interested in finding this spell. This trick can actually be used on a lot of different enemy types if you're trying to find a very rare item. It won't work for everything, it's not great for finding pink tails at the end of the game for instance, but it is very good for something like this. The only thing that the mages actually do is a spell called Blast, which can paralyze one of your party members, but I'm not actually sure that these guys can even damage you. Oh, and there's the Blast spell right there. So Rydia is paralyzed right now, but she's just been parrying the entire time anyways, so she is not an important part of this loop. Because of the amount of time it takes for Kane to do his jump attack, that gives us enough time for Rosa to get her turn and cast the Life 2 spell, so this whole thing works out very well. Unfortunately, Life 2 costs 52 magic points each time you cast it, and while Rosa has a lot of MP to work with, she will run out eventually. If you'd like to keep this loop going after she gets low on MP, you'll probably have to give her an elixir. But we'll just try it as long as we need to, and this time we were successful, and we found the Mage Summon item. So we'll use it from our inventory, and Rydia will learn another summon spell. Compared to the Imp Summon, the Mage Summon spell is much more powerful. It deals more damage, and it can possibly paralyze the enemy that it targets. Unfortunately, at this point in the game, it only hits one enemy, and most of our high-level summon spells are going to hit the entire battlefield, so we're not going to really get any use out of this. If you did find it earlier in the game, it would be much more handy. The last of the three extra summon spells is the Bomb Summon, but you won't find it from the normal bomb enemies. You need to find some more advanced bomb type monsters, like the grenades that we can encounter on the moon. The enemies that we're looking for can be found anywhere on the outer surface of the moon, and they are much more common than the mages. We didn't find them this time, so we're just going to run away. But if we keep looking, it won't be long before we find some grenades or balloons. So we're just going to stay close to the ship and keep looking for battles here on the surface of the moon. And these are the enemies we were looking for. Either of these enemy types could drop the bomb summon, and as you might expect, it's a rare item drop. The same Life 2 strategy that we used on the mages can work here, so we're going to get rid of the two balloons, and we're going to focus on killing and reviving one of the grenades. Remember, each time we kill and revive a grenade, the game thinks that we've killed a totally different enemy, so we'll get more experience and gold, and we'll get another chance at finding the item we're looking for. Fighting a lot of grenades in the same battle is a much more efficient way than just wandering around the moon until we meet them multiple times. So we're going to keep going until we run out of magic, and hopefully we'll be able to find that bomb summon. And full disclaimer, Doing this trick will not guarantee that you find the bomb summon, this will just improve your chances. So the more grenades you kill, the better your chances will be that you'll find the bomb summon, 
but it is never guaranteed. This will be the last special summon spell that we'll find in this version of the game. In the original Japanese version, as well as many of the later versions of this game, there was a fourth item-based summon spell, the Cock Trick Summon, but for whatever reason, that spell was removed for Easy Type and this version. I'm not sure why the Cock Trick Summon was removed from this version of the game. I don't think that it's unfair, but it is one of the better item-based summon spells that you can find. Unlike the mages that we were farming before, these grenades can actually damage our party members, and we want to save most of Rosa's magic points so that she can keep casting life too, so let's have Rydia cast her Azura summon spell. As long as we don't get the life version of the spell, it's going to restore a lot of our hit points. So let's see what we got. Very good, we restored a ton of HP with that. And now our party is ready to continue farming these grenades in hopes of finding the bomb summon. Honestly, this strategy helps, but I can't recommend anyone takes the time to try to find these special summon items. It can take a very long time to actually find one, and when you do, the spells just aren't that good in the late game. The Bomb Summon is an interesting one. It can deal a decent amount of damage, but it's based on how much HP Rydia has, and sadly, having high HP is something that Rydia is just not good at. If Cecil or Kane would gain an ability that dealt damage equal to how many hit points they had, that ability could get very powerful at high levels, but even at like level 99, Rydia will only have around five to 6,000 hit points, which is just way fewer than the other characters. When you level up in this game, the stats that you gain are not random, at least until you reach level 70, so Everything is set until you reach level 70, but if you go beyond level 70, you'll start gaining random stats, so different level 99 parties won't look exactly the same. Of course, leveling up higher than level 60 is completely unnecessary. With levels that high, you should be able to easily win the game. And we're getting low on magic points for Rosa, so we're going to wrap up this battle with the grenades. If we don't find the bomb summon, we can always just try it again. But let's see... Yes, there it is! The final item summon spell. Let's use that item and grant Rydia her final call spell. We are not going to be using any of these item-based summon spells in any important battles, so feel free to skip them if you don't want to go through the hassle of collecting them. But here's a demonstration of the bomb summon, and you'll be able to see that it deals damage equal to just about how many hit points Rydia has plus a small modifier based on her stats. So that's all it does. And here we'll finish up this battle. But with that, Rydia has her final call spell, and it's time to move on to the final dungeon. The entrance to the final dungeon is inside the Lunar's Lair, and there's no easy way to get there. We'll need to land our spaceship up on this ridge, and go through the lunar paths to get to where we need to go. Here we have three different flavors of flan, but none of them have very many hit points, so magic like Edge's Blitz can easily clear the whole lot of them. Just don't use physical attacks, you'll be lucky to deal more than one damage at a time. With those distractions out of the way, we'll save the game, and then we'll head on into Lunar Path A. 
We've been through Lunar Path A before, so we don't need to worry about collecting any treasure chests. And this time we're higher levels than we were before. So while we don't have Fusoya's magic, we should be more than capable if we have to face any battles in there. Luckily, we didn't have to. So we emerged on the other side, and now we'll head towards Lunar Path B. So just follow the Craterous Path, and here it is. Well, we were very lucky not to have to face any enemies there. But we will have to face a Jew Cyclote and a pair of Pro Cyclotes here in Path B. If these things have the chance to attack you, you could get poisoned. So that's the only thing that you really have to worry about with these monsters. You might have to cast a heal spell when it's all over. Bahamut will easily wipe these guys out, dealing massive amounts of damage to all of the enemies on the battlefield. So if you want to get something done, Bahamut can make it happen. At the conclusion of the battle, both Cecil and Rosa leveled up, so let's take a look at their stats. 66 strength, very powerful Cecil. And Rosa has an amazing 78 willpower. But we already know that she is a masterful healer. And we'll just continue towards the door. And that will take us to the other side of Lunar Path B. And from here, we just have to walk to the palace. These guys again. Well, luckily, Edge still has some magic points left. But if he doesn't, we could have any magic user just blast these guys with a big spell. Blitz just happens to be a very fast one. And we'll take our experience points and an Ether 1 and continue towards the Lunar's Lair. And here is another battle, this time against the balloons and the grenades. Now, we know that our party can last against these monsters for a very long time, so we really have nothing to fear here. Edge's Blitz magic will probably wipe them all out, but if it doesn't, a melee attack from Cecil or Kane should quickly finish the battle. And here's one from Kane. 1600 damage was more than enough. And this time, Rydia gained a level. So we are way overpowered for this area, and it looks like Rydia now has 71 wisdom, which is quite impressive. Let's see if we can make it inside without facing any more monsters. We did excellent, and now that we're inside, I'd like to show you an interesting trick. When you step on this panel, it'll restore your hit points. But if you step off to the side and press the A button, you can suddenly trigger a battle with two red giants. Very, very strange. Even more strange, the red giants don't behave normally. Instead, they keep trying to petrify the party, which is not something they would usually do. They also don't have the normal counterattacks that they would use when targeted by call magic. So feel free to use Bahamut against this pair of red giants. You won't have to worry about the repercussions. Once these monsters are defeated, they won't appear again. So I have no idea why this was included in the game. Is it a glitch? Is it something the programmers put in as a way to test a battle, and then they left it there? I have no idea, but it is interesting. Now that we're done fighting the red giants, we can head over to the right side of the room, where we can restore all of our magic points. This is probably the more useful of the two panels. You could easily just go over to the right side, have Rosa cure the party and then refill her MP, and then you wouldn't have to go to the left side at all. The last time we came here to the crystal room on the moon, the panel in the center was sealed by an unknown force, but now that we've destroyed the robot of Babel, the seal has been broken, and the way to the lunar subterrain is open. 
This is it. This portal leads to the final dungeon. Inside, we'll be able to travel to the center of the moon, where we can finally confront Zemus. But before we challenge Zemus, there are many treasures to find and many bosses to fight. So let's start out by making our way to the upper right corner. And here is our first battle of the final dungeon, a single warlock. A warlock by itself like this might not seem very threatening, but when a warlock is alone, it will cast the weak spell which will deal a ton of damage to one of your party members and will cost quite a few magic points to restore. So Rosa went all the way down to 2 HP, which is pretty annoying. The weak spell won't kill any of your party members, so it's unlikely that a single warlock would be able to wipe your party out, but it could cost you a lot of magic points, which is fairly obnoxious. This is a long dungeon, so losing a ton of magic points early on could be problematic when you get deeper in. Of course, we're just trying to get to this treasure chest right now, and here we have a warlock paired up with a carry. We've seen this same set of enemies in Bahamut's lair, so none of this should be new, but if you face a warlock paired with any other enemies, it won't use its weakness spell, until it becomes alone. We could take advantage of that by charming the warlock. They are certainly vulnerable to that. And when a warlock is charmed, it will use a spell that will instantly kill one of the enemies. So there it is, stone. The warlock turned itself into a statue, sort of like Palam and Forum. This chest contains monsters, and that's going to be a recurring theme in this dungeon. Most of the good stuff is protected by enemies. We just fought a pair of red giants inside of the Lunar's Lair, but those red giants weren't acting right. These ones have their normal behaviors. If you use call magic against them, they will explode and deal heavy damage to the party, but if you use normal black magic like the Quake spell, they'll counter with Beam, which is not as dangerous. When a red giant gets its turn, it will either attack one of your party members or it will use the Emission spell, which doesn't deal a whole lot of damage. You'll notice that physical attacks are not countered by the red giant, so a good way to deal with these guys could be to use the Berserk spell on Edge. Edge will attack very quickly and will deal a lot of damage, and we won't have to worry about any counters. So we can have Rosa use Cure Magic to keep our party's health up, and we'll have Cecil attack, Edge is attacking Berserk, and Kane is using Jump. At this point, we can just have Rydia parry, and with that, the two red giants are defeated. This time, Kane gained a level, so that's good, and we found what we were looking for, the Ninja Garb. Let's take a look at Kane's status. With 52 strength, he is a very strong attacker, and with 57 vitality, he is very hard to kill. Edge is up to 63 attack now, and let's try equipping him with the Ninja Garb. This armor not only raises his defense, but it also dramatically increases his evasion rate and adds 3 to his agility. So this is very good armor. You know how much I like a piece of equipment that increases agility. At this point, we would have to do a lot of backtracking to get where we need to go to, so instead, we can have Rydia cast her warp spell, and while we're back here in the Lunar's Lair, we might as well take advantage of the panels that can restore our hit points or magic points. Of course, we don't really need to worry about the one that restores hit points. We can just use magic to do that, and then we can refill our MP. So we'll have Rosa cast some curative magic. 
So you can just cast Cure 4 a couple times, that should do it. And then we'll step on this panel to restore everyone back to full power. We are just getting started here in the final dungeon. So let's head back to the panel in the middle of the crystal room and resume our journey into the lunar subterrane. Once we get back in there, instead of heading towards the upper right corner, we're going to go to the left. So that's the plan this time. There's going to be a teleporter over there and that's going to take us to a different part of the dungeon. You can feel free to come out here anytime you need to refill your HP and MP, but you will have to watch this short cutscene every time you go back into the dungeon. But it's a small price to pay to be able to restore our health and magic. So we're going to follow this path over here to the left and go through the teleporter that's labeled A on the map, and that will bring us over here to door B, and through door B, we'll be able to find this chest, which contains two warlocks and two carries. To quickly clear out these enemies, we're just going to use a cheat code, B-A-H-A-M-U-T, Bahamut. So Radia can cast that cure magic, and it should just blow right through these enemies. None of them have more than 4,250 hit points, so Bahamut should easily finish this fight. And here we go. Blast them with that Mega Flare. Bam! All the enemies have been vaporized, and now we can collect our rewards. Inside the chest is the Life Staff, and the Life Staff is an excellent item for Rosa. Not only can we use it to cast the spell of life for free when she uses it in battle, but it adds plus 15 to her willpower, so this is one of the most powerful staves in the entire game. Rosa already had a pretty good amount of willpower, but with the life staff, she's going to be able to cure better than ever. So that's certainly worth getting, but that's not all there is to find in this area. But first, we've been randomly attacked by a warlock, a carry, and a red giant. So three different enemy types, and we've seen them all before, but we haven't seen them all together. The most dangerous enemy of these three is the red giant, so we're going to focus our melee attacks on it and both the Warlock and the Carry are vulnerable to the Charm spell. We're going to have Rydia use her Charm Rod on the Carry, and we'll have Rosa cast Mute on the Warlock, which will make him extremely ineffective. Anytime the Warlock gets its turn, it's going to attempt a spell, but it won't be able to actually cast it because he's muted. The carry, whenever it gets its turn, will use a move called Hug, which will kill one of the enemies. This time it removed the carry itself. And we'll have Rydia cast Quake, which is going to get a beam counter from the red giant, but that's not too big of a deal. We're still focusing our attacks on the red giant. The warlock is effectively neutered at this point, none of its magic spells are going to work, and Kane's jump quickly finished it off. So that's the way I like to handle that set of enemies. And once we have Rosa cure the party, we're going to continue heading downwards towards the next teleporter. That will bring us over to the left side of this room. So head down here through the teleporter, and that will bring us over here. And here's that same set of enemies again, so this time we're going to quickly speed through the battle. Just remember, all you need to do is mute the warlock, charm the carry, and focus your melee attacks on the red giant. And with those enemies out of the way, we can continue our treasure hunt here in the final dungeon. You can see that there's a hidden path on the left side of this room, but it doesn't take you anywhere in particular. 
And here we have a warlock with not one carry, but two this time. With two carries instead of one, we're going to focus our melee attacks on one of the carries. We're going to have Rydia use her charm rod on the other carry. And we're going to mute the warlock with Rosa. So that's the basic plan here. We'll charm that carry and it seems to have worked. So now we just need to fight the warlock, which is not going to be able to hurt us because he's muted. Yeah, try to steal our magic points, that's not going to work. This time the carry used the hug on Rydia, which did turn her to stone, but she restored some hit points. We can easily fix that petrification with a heal spell. Just be careful that your entire party never becomes dead or petrified, because that would qualify for a game over. So Rosa used heal, now Rydia is back to normal, and Cecil finished the battle. We got 8700 experience points for that, and both Rosa and Cecil leveled up again. So let's take a look at their status. Cecil up to 67 strength, and Rosa, 84 willpower. Of course, we know Rosa is getting a plus 15 from that Lunar Staff we found, but 84 is still impressive for any stat. We'll have her cure the party since she is particularly well suited to do so. And once everyone is in good shape, we'll head through this door, which is labeled E on the map. And that will bring us to this area where you see this strange floating katana blade. Before you try to pick it up, make sure Rosa casts Float on the entire party. That's going to make this battle super easy. Also, if you have Artemis arrows, which Edge can steal from the carry enemies in this area, now would be a great time to equip them. This floating weapon is one of Edge's ultimate blades and it's protected by a dragon called the Pale Dim. When the Pale Dim gets its turn, it will use a physical attack that can be defended with the image or blink spells. So if you're worried about physical attacks, you can use those for protection. However, the thing you really need to worry about when facing this boss are its counter attacks. It will counter physical attacks with a slow spell, which can really hurt your party's damage output. It also counters call magic with the quake spell, and we're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut, which will deal a ton of damage to this boss, and because Rosa cast float on the party before we entered the battle, whenever this guy counters with quake, we won't take any damage. So that's why we wanted to have Rosa cast Float before the battle began. And the Artemis arrows are especially effective against dragons, so you'll see that Rosa's aim ability will deal a ton of damage to this boss. You want to make sure that whatever attacks you're doing to this boss are going to deal a lot of damage, because those slow spells will make you unable to deal too many attacks over time. With the Pale Dim defeated, both Rydia and Kane leveled up, and we were able to obtain the Murasame, Edge's second best weapon. Now, this weapon will add plus 5 to Edge's Strength, Vitality, and Wisdom, but it does subtract 5 from his Agility and Willpower, and I don't particularly like sacrificing Agility, but this is a very powerful katana, so we will use it for the time being. In the original Japanese version, using this blade as an item in battle would cast a defensive spell, but that spell was removed for this version of the game, so using the Murasame as an item in battle doesn't do anything special. We would have to do a lot of backtracking to get where we need to go again, so this time, instead of casting Warp, we had Rosa cast Exit, which will bring us back outside of Lunar's Lair. 
Once again, we can cure the party using Rosa's Cure 4. And once everybody has full hit points, we'll simply step on the right panel to restore everyone's magic to full. So that's a very quick way to fill the party back up to its maximum stats. And then we'll head on up through the center passage to get back to the crystal room. And then we'll go back into the lunar subterrain once again. This time we're going to go even deeper. We found almost all of the treasure on the upper few floors. But there are a few more things that we'll be able to pick up as we proceed to the lower levels. With a colorful burst of light, we'll finally leave the Lunar's Lair in the distance, because this time, we're on the direct path to Zemus. Before we take a single step in here, let's re-equip Rosa with her Lunar Staff, and then the way we need to go is down towards the door that's marked C on the map. So we'll head up the stairs and you can go left or right. I think left is a little bit faster and that will take us down here to door C, which leads us to this part of the map. And here we have a pair of red giants again. This time they aren't protecting a treasure chest, they are simply a random encounter. So we're going to have Rydia cast Quake, Cecil will attack, Kane will jump, and we'll have Rosa use Berserk on Edge, so we should get a good sense of how powerful his new weapon is. Let's try that thing out. So Rosa is currently casting Berserk, there it is. And Edge is now ready to go. Let's see how much damage he's dealing. There's an emission from the enemies. It seems like emission doesn't deal a whole lot of damage to our party members, so we aren't terribly concerned about it. And Rydia is going to continue casting Quake. And there's 1700 damage to the enemy in the back line, so that's a very good attack from Edge. Quake removed the front giant, and we will take a beam counter attack, but I think that Kane can handle taking slightly less than 300 damage. And with a big attack from Cecil, the battle is over, and this time it's Edge that leveled up. So let's take a look at his stats with his new weapon. 60 strength and 44 agility, not bad. And from here we're going to head through this hidden passage, that will lead us to the chest labeled 4 on the map. This chest contains a whip for Rydia, and this weapon does deal a lot of damage if you wanted to use Rydia as a melee attacker, but it also reduces her wisdom and willpower by 5, and those are the two most important stats for Rydia, so I do not recommend using the flame whip. Just use a powerful wand instead. Over here on the left side, we'll be able to find the Dragoon Shield, which adds 6 to your defense and provides protection from lightning, fire, and ice. So that is a very good shield. Only Cecil and Kane can use shields at this point in the game, but we will want them each to have a good one. Here we have the two red giants again, and although we've seen these monsters several times now, we're on a different floor, and there are some different monsters in this area. So while we got some familiar ones this time, it's very possible that we could see something like a D-Bone or a Ging Ryu, which would be a change of pace. But these are not D-Bones or Gang Ryus, so we're going to approach these Red Giants just as we have in the past. We'll have Rydia use Quake, we'll focus our melee attacks on the Red Giant in the front, and we'll have Rosa Berserk Edge so that he'll deal extra damage. That's basically the plan. We're not too concerned about the emissions, 
and we don't want to use call magic because that will cause the red giants to explode and they'll put heavy damage on our party members which we're going to have to heal off between the battles. So this will save us a bit of trouble and we should be able to easily handle this battle. A couple more attacks should do it. Maybe a jump from Kane or a big hit from Edge. And with that, the red giants are gone and we'll be able to continue on our journey. Once we're done with the curing phase, we're going to continue to the right where we'll find a passage that leads to the Dragoon Helmet. The Dragoon Helmet will protect from fire, ice, and lightning, which is redundant considering we already have the Dragoon Shield, but it does provide decent defense and magic defense, so we're going to equip it to Cecil for now. All of these items will eventually go to Kane, but I always want to give the best armor to Cecil because he has to be in the front line while Kane gets to hang out in the back line, which protects him from half of the damage that comes in. He also has fairly high vitality, so technically Kane would probably survive without wearing any armor, but we're still going to give him whatever we have left. That being said, considering that the Dragoon Helm and the Dragoon Shield both add protection from fire, ice, and lit, it's probably a good idea to give one item to Kane and one item to Cecil so that they can both have that protection. And in this chest we'll find the Dragoon Gloves which will complete the set. So we'll equip those to Cecil, and then we'll be attacked by two Warlocks and a Red Giant. Another set of familiar enemies in a new configuration. Instead of going for the charm on the Warlocks this time, we're just going to have Rydia cast Quake, because that will damage the Warlocks and the Red Giant, and it might even kill off a Warlock or two. If any Warlocks survive, we can have Rosa use Mute on them. That will make them ineffective. And then we can focus our melee attacks on the Red Giant. So one Warlock is left, and uh, he stole a whole magic point from Rosa. It was lucky that he didn't steal more. But that was not a particularly dangerous attack. And with Kane's landed jump and a mute on the Warlock, we're in pretty good shape now. A few more hits should finish off that Giant. He's the only one that's dangerous at this point. We'll have Rydia parry. There's no need to get a counterattack from the Giant, especially when the Warlock can't really do anything. He's muted. Here's an omission. Put 112 damage on Edge. Oh no. And a few more hits should do it. Okay, well, Cecil took out the Red Giant, so that jump should easily finish off the Warlock. And we'll take our 10,000 experience points and continue through the dungeon. Once we've collected all of the treasures down here in the lower right corner of the map, we want to backtrack to the door that's labeled F on the map. That will take us deeper into the dungeon. So we'll just head back through these passages, and here we have a new enemy, a D-Bone. D-Bones have 9,000 hit points, and they will just attack whenever they get their turn. They're also undead, so they're weak against fire and curative magics. Watch what happens when we hit it with Cure 4. It's going to deal some serious damage to this thing. 8,500 will be enough to finish off the D-Bone, and easily wins the fight. We didn't take much of a beating in that battle, but I kind of forgot to heal Rydia after the previous battle, so we'll rectify that situation now. Better late than never. Now we'll head through this passage, and up through Doorway F. That will bring us down to the fourth floor. We're going to start off by heading to the right, and here we have another D-Bone. If you don't want to waste Rose's magic points on offense, we could always have her parry and just have Rydia cast Fire 3 instead. Because this guy is undead, Fire 3 is going to be very effective and will likely deal maximum damage to this monster. 
If it were to survive a hit from fire magic, it would counter with a fire attack of its own, but it is highly unlikely to survive fire three. So there it is for all nines, and that will easily defeat the D-Bone. Using Fire 3 is more efficient than casting Cure 4, so that's probably the best way to defeat the D-Bones. Up here in this chest we'll find a few more Artemis arrows, not a terribly important chest to collect, so feel free to skip that one. And down here we have a trio of Warlocks. We know these guys are vulnerable to the Charm spell, but they're also extremely vulnerable to the Stone spell that Rydia learned recently. We can also target all three of them with it, and assuming we don't have some bad luck, it should actually clear all of the enemies at once. So here's that Stone spell, and there go the Warlocks. So that's a very good way to deal with three Warlocks. Keep that one in mind, and it looks like Rosa and Cecil both leveled up, and this time Rosa learned the spell of White, which is some very powerful offense magic for Rosa. Cecil has 69 strength now, nice. And Rosa is up to 85 willpower. She can put that willpower to use curing the party, we'll make sure that everyone's wounds are dealt with, and then we will continue on this floor. Over on the left side, we're going to find a small room that contains an elixir, so we'll want to pick that up. We're getting close to the end of the game, and having an item that can restore a character's hit points and magic points to full is going to be very helpful. You'll want as many of those as you can grab. And once again, we have to fight a D-Bone. This is the most common battle on this floor, so you are likely to see a lot of these. We know what to do about this guy, we're going to cast Fire 3, but we've been hitting this enemy so hard with our melee attacks, that it's possible that it won't survive to get burned by the Fire 3. We'll have Kane just attack, maybe he can get in there before Rydia casts her spell, but nope, there it is. That Fire 3 will spell doom for this pile of bones. And with that, it disintegrates, and the battle is over. From here, we're going to head all the way to the right side, where we'll find a set of stairs that will take us to the bottom, and a door that's labeled G on the map. But before we can go in there, are you serious? Another D-Bone? I know I said they were the most common enemy type on this floor, but this is getting ridiculous. Let's try just using melee attacks this time. We'll have Rydia parry, and Rosa can parry as well. Well, I guess that was the consequence of using this strategy. Cecil got poisoned. It's not that big of a deal, we can easily heal it after the battle is over, but he has a purple face right now and looks very silly. Well, we'll see how silly you look, D-Bone, when you're dead. 2800 experience points, and we can have Rosa take care of that poison. Or heck, we can just use a heal potion. What are we saving them for? And with that, we'll continue on into door G. But first, well, okay, at least this battle is a little bit different. This time, we have the D-Bone paired with a Warlock. We'll try to use our typical strategy here and charm that Warlock using the Charm Rod. We can use Cure 4 to defeat the D-Bone, although our melee attacks probably could get us there. I don't see any reason to take chances, so we'll have Rosa use her powerful magic on that D-Bone, and this time she only dealt a little bit over 6,000 damage, which is not great for Cure 4 but the Warlock took himself out of the equation, so that certainly helps. And another melee attack from Kane coming out of the sky will easily end the battle, and this time Rydia gained a level. So we can take a look at her status. Rydia now has 72 wisdom and 50 willpower. And then we'll head on through the door. This is a fairly large room, and inside we'll be able to find a couple of treasure chests that contain Cure 3 potions. 
So you may want to grab those. There's one in the upper corner and one over in the lower left. Before we can pick up this one though, we have a new enemy, the D Fossil. The D Fossil is like a more powerful version of the D Bones that we've been fighting recently. But this guy will not only attack you, but will also try to curse your characters so that they take additional damage from those attacks. So there's the curse on Edge. Of course, these are still undead, so they are weak against fire and holy magic. And let's try out Rosa's white magic that she just learned, which is an extremely powerful white attack spell. It's kind of like a white version of Nuke. The white spell deals bonus damage based on Rosa's willpower. So yeah, she can deal a ton of damage with that spell. Of course, Rosa should focus on being the party's healer first, but sometimes being able to hit an enemy with the white spell can be very useful. Outside of door H, we'll find a chest that contains a very valuable weapon for Rydia, but it's guarded by a behemoth. Of course, we already know how to deal with behemoths. We can have Edge use his image, and we can have Rosa cast Blink on Cecil. That will protect our frontline party members from counterattacks whenever we attack the behemoth. Remember, the counterattacks are the only thing you really have to worry about when facing the behemoth. So as long as you're not poking the bear, it won't deal any damage to you. If you put blink spells on your frontline attackers, then the behemoth won't be able to hurt them until the blink shields go down, and behemoths can't deal a whole lot of damage to your backline characters because they're protected by merit of being in the backline. Behemoths have exceptional magic defense so don't bother using offensive magic in this battle. Instead, your wizard should focus on playing a supporting role in this fight, or they can just parry. Even when Rydia is parrying, if the behemoth attacks her, the parry will prevent even more damage, and that hit won't go to one of your other characters removing a blink shield. So even though she's not actively doing anything in the battle, Rydia is still useful just for being there. And with that, the behemoth is defeated. We'll get a decent amount of experience for that, which promotes Edge and Kane to the next level. And we'll also get that Stardust Wand. This wand is excellent. It adds plus 15 to Rydia's wisdom, and if she uses it as an item in battle, she can cast the spell of Comet for free, but remember, that spell will not receive the benefits of her wisdom, so it's never going to be as good as a spell that she would cast normally. But that's totally okay. Even if the free Comet spell is not that useful, you had me at plus 15 wisdom. Down this stairway will reach floor 5, and over on the right side you'll see a conspicuous looking sword. That is Cecil's crystal sword, but we'll have to take a longer path around to get it. First we're going to open this chest, which is guarded by a red and a blue dragon. These living dragons are a lot more powerful than the dusty piles of bones we've been fighting so far. They will use elemental magic spells against the party, and they have a lot of hit points. Also, you need to be careful that you don't use any elemental magic against them, because a lot of it will be absorbed. Instead, we're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut. Bahamut doesn't have any magic type, so it will not be absorbed by the dragons. Then we'll just need to deal a bit more damage using our melee attacks to finish them off, and considering that the blue dragon has fewer hit points, I would focus your attacks on that one first. The blue dragon absorbs ice, but the red dragon is weak against ice magic, so when it's the only dragon left, ice is the way to go. So we're going to cast ice 3, which deals a ton of damage and finishes the fight. 
For that, we'll get over 17,000 experience points, and we'll be able to find the Crystal Shield. The Crystal Shield is a shield that only Cecil can use, and it boasts impressive defensive stats. It also increases his willpower by 3, which is a pretty nice bonus from a shield. It'll make his cure spells more effective if we need to use them. And you can see that willpower bonus applied there. We'll have Rosa do some curing after the previous battle. Those dragons did deal some damage to our party, so we will want to take care of that. And then we'll be able to continue on. The Crystal Shield is the first piece in Cecil's Ultimate Crystal Set, and the other pieces of Crystal Gear are scattered across this floor. Here inside this room, we have to face a D-Fossil again. The D-Fossils are very common in this room, and we know we can easily deal with them by using the White Spell or by using Fire Magic. Oh no, we got cursed! This D-Fossil will be lucky to even attack a second time to make that curse worth anything. And here comes the spell of White from Rosa, which will win the battle. And that's it. We can now continue our Lunar Treasure Hunt. We'll cure the party as usual, and it looks like Rosa is getting low on magic points, so it's time for her to chug some ethers. Remember to use your Aether ones first when you're outside of battle, and if you want to get a character's magic points back up while you're in battle, at this point in the game, I would recommend just throwing an elixir at them. It's always good to completely refill the magic points. That can totally turn the tide of battle. Inside this chest, we found a Protect Ring, and there are two of these to find here in this dungeon. The Protect Ring provides 10 defense, 12 magic defense, and adds plus 15 to vitality. But that's not all. It also provides defense against fire, ice, and lit magics, so those Protect Rings are very good to pick up. And here we have another chest defended by a behemoth. Behemoths look tough, but we know how to deal with them. We're going to use the old blink and image strategy. And just remember, behemoths are mostly passive if you're not attacking them. So if you ever look like your party is going to get wiped out, you can just stop attacking the behemoth, take a moment to use items, your curing spells, whatever you need to do, bring everyone back to full health, and then you can start fighting the behemoth again. It will simply wait for you to do that. Once you understand how these bad guys work, there's really no reason why you should ever get annihilated by a behemoth. We took a big hit on Edge there, but he can actually handle it. We blinked Rydia because Edge can handle imaging himself. Unfortunately, he can't use the image spell on someone else. That would be cool though if he could. And here it is. He put up his own blink shield. Kane's going to do a jump, and it shouldn't take too much more to finish this fight. For extra protection, we can have Rosa blink herself. There's almost no reason to blink Kane. Oftentimes, Kane will be in the air when someone is attacking the behemoth. I'm sure this is not the fastest way to defeat a behemoth, but it's certainly the safest way. Edge finishes the fight, we'll grab our experience points, Cecil gains a level, and we'll be able to collect the Crystal Armor. The Crystal Armor is excellent. It provides 25 defense, it prevents all sorts of status effects, and it even provides a little bit of magic defense. The only downside to the Crystal Armor is you won't be able to berserk Cecil anymore while he's wearing it, but that's a small price to pay for the protection that it provides. With the Crystal Armor, Cecil is going to be very hard to kill, but there's still a few more Crystal items for us to find. Before we can get them though, we have to battle a Fatal Eye. A Fatal Eye has 25,000 hit points, and annoyingly keeps putting these countdown timers on your characters. 
If the countdown ever reaches zero, that character will die. Of course, if it puts the countdown on the same character twice, it will actually refresh the counter, bringing it back up to 10. So that was certainly a mistake by the fatal eye here, but the plan is usually to just try to kill this thing before any of the counters run out. So you just want to focus on maximum offense. Have Rosa cast white, have Rydia cast fast tier 3 magic like Ice 3, have Cecil and Edge attack, and have Kane jump. If you're fast, you should be able to get out of this battle without losing more than one character. Fatal Eyes take a lot of energy to kill, but they are worth a lot of experience points, and that time Rosa leveled up, so we'll take a look at her stats. 45 vitality and 83 willpower, very good. And we'll have her cure the party, although the Fatal Eye didn't actually deal us any damage. We just need to do some curing from previous battles that we fought. And then we'll head back into this passage, and this time we're going to go through the door at the top. But first, we need to face a King Ryu. This coiled dragon uses lightning attacks, and will counter with an Entangle spell any time that it takes damage. The Entangle spell can paralyze one of your party members, so you want to just try to deal as much damage at one time as you can, thus preventing some of those counters. And it looks like Kane got Entangled, but here comes the White spell, which should deal quite a bit of damage, and that will be enough to win the battle. A single King Ryu is really nothing to be too concerned about, and after a few cure spells from Rosa, we should be able to continue on. So we're going to head towards the door labeled L on the map, and that will bring us back out onto floor 5, but first we have to face another one of these King Ryus, so we're just going to quickly speed through this battle. You know what to do. Hit it hard, watch out for those counterattacks. Rydia gained a level and learned weak, so that's pretty awesome. Let's take a look at her status, and she's up to 78 Wisdom, wow, and 51 Willpower, which could matter. And it looks like Rosa needs a few more Ethers. Whenever she's casting that White spell, it does put a drain on her MP. So don't be afraid to throw some Ethers around onto your Wizards. We aren't going to be saving them for anything else. And now we'll have Rosa do a few Cures. She can just throw a Cure 1 on the whole party, and that actually seemed to fix us up pretty well. And now we'll head back outside, where we can open this chest, which of course contains monsters. This valuable treasure is guarded by a pair of red dragons, and we saw a red dragon previously, but it was paired with a blue dragon that time. And while the red dragons may be technically more powerful than the blue variety, they don't absorb as many different elements, so we have a lot more different magic that we can use against them. Rosa's white spell, for instance, would be absorbed by the blue dragon, but the red dragons don't absorb it at all, and will take normal damage from it. Rydia's ice magic is also going to be very good here. The red dragons are weak against it, and will take massive damage even when you target both of them with the same spell. This white action should take out one of the two dragons, and then we have Cecil attacking the red dragon, and we're going to have Edge replenish his image shield, which has been protecting him quite well so far. We can have Rydia cast Ice 2 this time. I think that should be enough to finish off the remaining dragon. It won't be divided by two because it's only targeting a single enemy this time, and the weakness will make it deal more damage. And that was just enough to do it. So we received a ton of experience points, Kane gained a level, and we found the Crystal Gloves. We'll take a look at Kane's status because he just leveled up, and he's up to 60 vitality and 56 strength, so very powerful. And then we'll equip Cecil with the Crystal Gloves. The Crystal Gloves, like many other pieces of crystal equipment, add 3 to Cecil's willpower and provide very good defense. We'll be able to hand the Dragoon Gloves down to Kane, 
and now he is able to wear a nice set of armor as well. We still need to find the Crystal Helm, so once everyone is all cured up from the battle with the two red dragons, we're going to head back down and go over to the left where we'll find a door labeled M on the map. So that's where we're going to go next. We'll go right past door L and over here to door M. In this small room, we'll find a chest that contains the white robe, which is a very good piece of armor that Cecil could wear, but we're going to give it to Rosa. It adds plus 15 to willpower, so you know she's going to like that, and it also adds plus 18 to physical defense, as well as plus 10 to magic defense. It even prevents darkness, for whatever that's worth. So before wearing the white robe, Rosa has 83 willpower, and after we switch out the sorcerer robe, which does provide a plus 5 to willpower, she should have a net of plus 10. And there it is, 93 will. That is an exceptionally high stat. Now that we have the white robe equipped, we'll head towards door N, but first we have to fight a tricker. This enemy really wants us to know that it's weak against thunder, but it's called a tricker, so, hmm, maybe there's something more to this. And there is. If you use a weak spell like Lit 1 against the tricker and it doesn't die, it will go totally berserk, and you will wish that you didn't do that. However, this thing is weak against lightning magic, so if we use Lit 3, it will almost certainly get vaporized after being hit by a few melee attacks first. So Rydia is going to cast Lit 3, which will deal maximum damage to the Tricker, and it won't have a chance to go nuts. As long as you don't do anything stupid against a Tricker, that guy is totally harmless. Over here, we can make our way towards the next chest, but first we have to face a Fatal Eye. And if you don't want to fight the Fatal Eye, it can take a while to run away. So this is actually a good time to use Edge's Smoke Spell. You'll notice as you get deeper and deeper into this dungeon that running away will get more and more difficult, and the Smoke Spell will become more valuable if you want to escape from enemies. Guarding this chest, we have a Warlock and a D-Fossil, which is a pretty weak combination of enemies compared to the ones we've been fighting lately. We're going to have Rosa mute the Warlock, and we're going to have Rydia cast Fire 3 on both enemies, which should deal heavy damage to the D-Fossil, and will likely deal a good amount of damage to the Warlock as well. And there we did almost 5,000 damage to the D fossil, so it should not have very many hit points left. And now that the Warlock is muted, we don't have to worry about it casting weak once it becomes the only enemy left on the battlefield. It's totally something it's going to try to do. Let's try out that Stardust Wand. This free Comet spell doesn't deal a ton of damage, but it does hit all enemies on the battlefield, and it is free. And with that, we have won the battle, and we'll be able to claim our prize, the Crystal Helm. The Crystal Helm provides protection against the basic elements, just like the Dragoon Helm does, but it has more physical defense, more magic defense, and it adds three to Cecil's willpower. He's the only one that can equip the Crystal Helm, so once he has it, we can give Kane the Dragoon Helm, and he will certainly appreciate the upgrade. After changing equipment and recovering from the previous battle, we're going to make our way to the right, where we will find a very interesting room that's labeled O on the map. But first, we have to face a single blue dragon. This is the most common battle on this floor. The blue dragon absorbs most types of magic, so don't use the white spell, fire 3, ice 3, lit 3, nothing like that should be used against the blue dragon. 
Luckily, Rydia has the Bahamut spell, which does not have a magic type, and these dragons don't have any resistance to it. So that will certainly deal them a ton of damage, and anytime you see dragons, whether it's red or blue, Bahamut could be an effective strategy. So this will likely deal over 9,000 damage to the blue dragon, which will almost certainly kill it. And with that, we've won another battle. This time Cecil gained a level, and let's take a look at his status. Cecil now has 72 strength. Very impressive. From here, we're going to keep heading to the right. There's nothing in the lower right corner, but inside of the room labeled O, we'll be able to find a cabin. But that's not the only thing we can find in here. It seems like there's just a simple treasure chest here with a basic item inside, but this single room is home to one of the most rare and important monster types in the game, the Pink Puffs. This room is the only room in the game where you can encounter Pink Puffs, and they are the rarest encounter in the room so you may have to run away from a ton of enemies before you meet them a single time. You'll also want to equip your best melee weapons, even on your magic users. So we're just going to wander around this room hoping to meet the pink puffs, and anytime we don't find them, we're going to run away. It may take a while to find the pink puffs at all, and this is what they look like. I recommend having everyone focus their attacks on a single pink puff because at some point the music is going to change and several of your characters will become berserked. The monsters say let's dance and that's when the berserking starts. If you have a chance to have Rydia cast Nuke on one of them and while these monsters are in the Flan family, they are not immune to physical attacks, which would be a total disaster. There's almost no way we would ever beat these pink puffs if they were immune to physical attacks like other flan monsters. So why go through all the trouble of trying to find these guys? Well, if you are extremely lucky, they could drop an item called a pink tail, and we can trade that tail to the tail collector to get the game's best armor. Unfortunately, this item is so rare and meeting pink puffs takes a long time on its own that doing this is probably not worth it. Yes, the adamant armor is awesome. It can be equipped to any character. It gives you plus 100 physical defense and it adds plus 15 to every stat. It also prevents all status ailments and protects from fire, ice, and lit. The problem is, finding a pink tail could take hours or even days. Yeah, I'm serious. It could take forever to find one of these things. I don't even want to talk about how long it took me to get one. Also, if you're not careful, the battle with the pink puffs could definitely go awry, and if many of your characters are berserked, there's not much you can do about it. So make sure that you are not being lazy about keeping your characters healed to full health between battles. And it looks like we're definitely going to defeat the pink puffs this time, and we will cross our fingers and hope that we will get a treasure screen and we will find a pink tail. Will this be the time? Yes, that is what we are looking for. So you have to be very, very lucky, or you need to spend a whole lot of time, but either way, once you find a pink tail, you simply need to bring it back to the tail collector. The tail collector will be very excited to see the pink tail, and he certainly respects the amount of time it takes to get one of these things. So once you hand it over, you'll be able to get the best armor in the game. If you do get the adamant armor, any character equipped by it will be almost unkillable. So yeah, 
it will be worth it in the end, but I'm not going to assume that anyone is going to take the time to get this very, very rare piece of equipment. In the original Japanese version and many later versions of the game, there's an item called a siren or an alarm that you can use to summon the pink puffs in that room, and that makes farming them take a lot less time. But that item was removed from this version of the game, so getting the adamant armor is extremely difficult. I'm not going to assume that anyone watching this video is willing to put in the time to get the adamant armor, so we will not be using it for any of the strategies moving forward. Something we will be using is the crystal sword, and to get it we need to cross an invisible bridge and then go down inside this area to emerge in this lower part of the sixth floor. Most of the hidden passages in this game are clearly marked, but the one in the middle of this floor is not. Here we have three warlocks. We could certainly use stone on all of them, but we did that last time, so we'll try a slightly different strategy this time, and we'll have Rydia cast Quake, and we'll have Rosa use Mute, and we'll just try to pick off the remaining warlocks with melee attacks. So this will also work, but stone is such a more elegant solution to the warlock problem that it's probably the way to go. Still, it helps to have some different strategies available, and muting the warlocks will make them extremely useless in combat. So once these guys are muted, they are completely safe, and we can take them out at our leisure. Rosa gained a level this time, as did Edge, so we can take a look at their stats. We'll start with Edge. Edge is up to 63 strength and has 47 agility, very fast. And Rosa has a whopping 95 willpower now, which is just incredible. To get to the Crystal Sword, we need to go to the teleporter in the lower right corner of the map that's labeled Q. Once we step on this teleporter, it's going to take us to a very large set of stairs, and we simply need to climb to the top. Before we start our ascent, we'll use some ethers to make sure that our wizards have enough magic points to go on. There could be some very dangerous monsters over here. And here's our first encounter on the stairs, a pair of blue dragons. We know that the blue dragons absorb most types of magic, but they don't absorb Bahamut, so we're going to have Rydia cast that to deal them almost 10,000 damage each, which will bring their hit points down to a more manageable level. We're going to focus all of our melee attacks on the dragon at the top. We'll only need to deal about 3,000 damage to finish it off. So between Cecil, Edge, and Kane, we should be able to get the job done, and then we'll only have to deal with the bottom dragon. So, well, Cecil and Edge were able to do it alone, and now we'll just need a couple of hits to finish off the remaining dragon. Rosa can keep the party's health high, so she threw a Cure 4 on us to make sure that everyone was safe earlier, and now Edge can finish the battle. This one should be worth a good amount of experience points, over 14,000 each, and we also found a shuriken, so that was pretty good. We'll continue heading up the stairs, and that will bring us back to floor 5, where we will continue our climb. And here we have a Fatal Eye. If you don't want to fight the Fatal Eye, you can have Edge use his smoke magic, which will make sure that you run away before any of your character's countdowns expire. If you don't intend to run away from the Fatal Eye, make sure to use your most powerful magics and attacks. We won't have a lot of time before several of our party members get killed, unless of course the Eye is foolish enough to use its count spell on the same character twice. That would refresh the counter and give you more time. Rosa will use her white magic, our melee attackers will attack, Kane is getting very low on his count, but hopefully this fire 3 will finish the battle before he runs out of time. And that did it. 
we were able to defeat the fatal eye and no one died. So we got 8,000 experience points. Rydia learned the fatal spell, which is what doom is called in this game, but I guess they didn't want to call it doom or death. So instead they called it fatal. And you can see she's up to 79 wisdom. Kane also leveled up and he has 57 strength now. And it looks like we're going to need a few more ethers before we can continue. Our stock of ethers is dwindling, but don't worry about it too much. We still have 12 ether 2s and 19 elixirs. Inside this chest, we'll have to face another behemoth. And by now, behemoths are becoming a little bit boring. We've killed so many of these at this point. I'm not even sure that we need to play it so safe anymore against these behemoths, but we're going to do it anyways just in case. So we'll have Edge cast Image, we'll cast Blink on Cecil, and then we will bring our most powerful physical attacks while our wizards parry. So Kane is going to jump, Rydia is going to parry, Rosa could parry, or if she wants to, she could use Berserk on one of our characters. She could replenish the blinks if one of them runs out. Or she could cast Curative Magic, assuming any of our characters have taken a lot of damage. So Rosa is a very important part of this battle, but she's just kind of being a damage sponge right now and absorbing some hits from the Behemoth. Wow, Rydia took a big one there. We may need to cure her before moving on, or she could die. Not that we would lose the battle if she did die, but we would have to bring her back to life, which would cost additional magic points. So we'll put a shield on her, that will keep her safe for now. And with another hit from Cecil, the Behemoth is defeated, and we'll be able to collect another Protect Ring. So that is a very good prize. We already had one Protect Ring, but this one we can put on Edge. With Edge doing important work in our front lines, the extra vitality and protection provided by the Protect Ring will certainly be welcome. Also, now that Edge isn't using it anymore, I'm going to equip the Strength Ring to Kane to give his attacks a little bit more bite. We'll head through this teleporter that brings us to a save room, and we've been looking for one of these for a while. We're going to use a cabin to restore all of our HPs and MPs to the max, and then we are definitely going to save the game. It's been almost an hour since our last save. There are numerous bosses ahead, so we'll make sure to save the game, and here's one of those bosses right now. This one is protecting the Crystal Sword and is called the Wyvern. The Wyvern is like a souped up version of Bahamut, but instead of counting down, it just does the Mega Nuke right away. So we're going to need to recover from that Mega Nuke. We may even need to use Life 2 to bring a character back from the dead. After that though, the wyvern backs off a bit, it'll cast wall on itself. So we're going to need to use magic against it that will not be reflected by a wall, like Rydia's quake spell. Once the wall is up, the boss will start delta attacking the party by casting nuke on itself and reflecting that nuke at one of our party members. This is nowhere near as bad as the Mega Nuke that it started the battle with. Rosa should use her most powerful white magic to keep the party alive. Casting Cure 4 on the entire team is a good way to go. If Rosa gets killed by the initial Mega Nuke, make sure to use items and whatever you have to bring her back to life right away. Keeping Rosa in the fight is essential to your success. As long as you're able to survive that initial mega nuke attack, the rest of the battle is not that difficult. Just keep having Cecil and Edge attack, Rydia will cast Quake, Kane can keep up his jump attack, 
and Rosa will keep the party alive with her curative magic. If Kane gets very low on health, you may need to keep him on the ground for one round so Rosa can cure him. This boss has 25,000 hit points, and it's hard to hit him with anything that deals more than 3 or 4,000 damage at a time. So just keep chipping away, make sure that Rosa keeps the party alive, and it won't take too many rounds to defeat this boss, and we'll be able to get the game's best weapon for Cecil. So that's what's on the line here. Rydia can use another Quake, and that was a very strong one that hit for over 4,500 damage. And with that, we'll be able to pick up the Crystal Sword. The Crystal Sword adds a whopping plus 200 to Cecil's attack, and it also adds plus 15 to his strength, vitality, and willpower. A truly insane weapon. Before we move on, this is a good time to remind you about the weapon duplication trick from part one of this series. You can use it to make copies of the Excalibur, which is Cecil's second most powerful weapon. Why would we rather copy the Excalibur instead of the Crystal Sword? Well, the game won't allow Edge to dart the Crystal Sword, but he can dart Excalibur, so if you make a big supply of Excaliburs, you could potentially use them to deal tons of damage to enemies. So that's certainly something to keep in mind. And here's what it looks like when you use Excalibur as a dart. So we're fighting a behemoth here in this example battle. We certainly know what that looks like. And we're going to have Edge dart one of our 44 Excaliburs. And let's see how much damage that deals to a behemoth. Over 9,000! So yeah, this is certainly cheating, but that's a powerful trick you can use. Here we have the Fatal Eye again. I'm just going to use Edge's smoke magic so that we can get away from it quickly. And one nice benefit of the smoke magic is you don't lose money. Not that we were going to spend it on anything at this point in the game, but I don't like losing it anyways. We'll go back through the save room so we can use another cabin to replenish our health and magic, and then it would certainly be a good idea to save the game after obtaining the best weapon. So we'll quickly save, and then we're going to head back through the teleporter and back down the stairs. So we need to do a little bit of backtracking here, but now that we have the Crystal Sword, uh, let's try it out against this Fatal Eye and see how much more damage Cecil deals. All right, we have a countdown on Rosa. Rydia will cast Fire 3. And there's Cecil's attack with the Crystal Sword, which dealt over 2,700 damage. Pretty good. That weapon is going to be especially good against the final boss, so I would say that while it isn't mandatory that you get the Crystal Sword, it is highly recommended. Fire 3 will deal a good bit of damage there, and here comes a white spell from Rosa, which should finish the job. And you can see that with the Crystal Sword, our party is just that much better. And it looks like Cecil gained a level as well. Not bad. Let's take a look at his status. 78 strength, very good. And we're going to continue down the stairs. To get to Zemus, we need to head back here to floor 6, and we'll need to take an alternate path. Here's another Fatal Eye. I'm just going to speed right through this battle. We've certainly seen the Fatal Eye before. So we'll quickly clear it out, and then we'll continue along on our way. Edge leveled up this time, so our characters are doing pretty good on the levels. Most of them are over level 50, with the exception right now being Rydia. And we're going to go down to the bottom of the stairs, and from here, we're going to go back up to the top. 
So we need to head up this set of stairs. And that will take us to this hidden area. And we'll cross back over the hidden path. So back over to the right side, and then we'll go up these stairs and down the ones on the right side. Now we're back on the path to Zemus. Here we have to fight another blue dragon, but we're going to show it who the superior dragon is, and we'll have Rydia call upon Bahamut to fry this fool. We can also have Rosa Berserk Edge. That could be another way to deal a lot of damage. And Cecil is hitting quite hard with his crystal sword. The blizzard attack from the blue dragon did nothing that time, but Kane's attack wasn't super great either. But it doesn't matter very much. Edge is hitting pretty hard, so as soon as Bahamut goes off, we are going to win this fight. And there it is. Give him the mega nuke, Bahamut. All nine should be plenty of damage. And that will clear out the battle, and this time Rosa gained a level. So let's see where Rosa is at status-wise. 96 willpower now. So yeah, I mean, we knew Rosa was an exceptional healer, but those points of willpower are definitely going to come in handy when we get to the final boss. So every point is important. And then we're going to continue down on this side, but we have to face another blue dragon, so I'm just going to speed through the battle this time. You know what to do. We're going to cast Bahamut and show the dragon who's boss, and then we will be on our way. Down here, we can face another fight, but it's a different one. A red giant and a Ging Ryu. The Ging Ryu is from the same family as the King Ryu that we faced before, but this enemy type mostly just fights against your party. If it lasts long enough, it will cast a blaze spell that will damage multiple party members, but the one interesting thing that the Ging Ryu does is it counters call magic by using a tornado spell which can weaken one of your characters. So you may want to avoid call magic against King Ryu's unless you're fairly confident it will deal enough damage to kill them. We're probably not going to be using call magic against red giants anyways, so in this case we're mostly going to focus on melee attacks and we can have Rydia cast Quake while Rosa uses her white spell to quickly finish off the King Ryu. Those enemies seem a lot weaker than the blue dragons we've been fighting recently, so that was a nice change of pace. Inside this small room, we can find the heroine armor, but it is protected by a warlock and three carries. Oh no! We know what to do about these guys. Let's hit them with Bahamut. I mean, the carries only have 2700 health, I'm pretty sure Bahamut will be able to take care of them. We'll still have our melee attackers focus on the frontline enemies, but I don't think these enemies are going to last very long once Rydia calls in the King of the Dragons. And here's that Bahamut spell, blasting the face off of these enemies, and that will certainly be enough. With those bad guys out of the way, Rydia gained a level and learned Nuke, so that's nice. Kane also gained a level, very good, and there's that heroine armor. The heroine armor is armor that can only be worn by a woman, so Rydia or Rosa. Unfortunately, this armor gives you a minus 15 penalty to wisdom and willpower, so you would only use the heroine armor if you wanted to turn one of your wizards into a melee attacker. There could be some times where you'd want to do that, but for the most part, you will not be using the heroine armor. I would consider equipping the heroine armor when trying to find pink puffs, because we just want to make our wizards into melee attackers in that scenario, so that's something that you could do with it. Here we have another tricker, and I just love these little guys. There he is, floating around in the air because reasons, and he's just yelling out to us, Bolt me! 
bolt me! You won't use lightning, you cowards! Come on, green hair. Bet you don't know how to cast a basic lightning spell. And Rydia just kinda sighs, cracks her knuckles, and says under her breath, You asked for it, fool, as she loads up Lit 3. Yeah, this guy certainly is weak against lightning, and if you hit it with a weak enough lightning spell, it will go berserk, and that will be interesting. But whenever you hit this guy with Lit 3, it will almost certainly die. And with that trigger out of the way, we'll be able to collect some experience points and continue on our journey. This door up ahead is labeled V on the map, and it's the only way to get down here to the seventh floor. And here we have a D fossil. We've certainly seen a D fossil before. We know that it's undead, and we know that it's weak against holy magic as well as fire magic. So the white spell should wrap this up nicely, and we'll soften up this monster with a few melee attacks to make sure that it's enough. Although it doesn't look like we needed the white spell this time, because the crystal sword has a holy element in its attack, it dealt maximum damage to the D fossil. Well, that was awesome. And this first room, labeled 1 on the map, is a save room. So that's a sight for sore eyes. We'll use a cabin, restore our HP and MP, and then we'll have an opportunity to save the game. As we leave the safety of this save room behind, keep in mind that this is the last save room in the entire game. Moving forward, there will not be any more save points, so if you need to use a cabin or save the game, you will have to go back to that save room. And we're going to head into the room labeled 2 on the map. Inside here, we'll find Kane's ultimate weapon, or at least the best weapon that we can find that's not randomly dropped by monsters. And to get it, we'll need to fight a boss, the Plague. This boss is an interesting test. It's going to cast count on our entire party, and when those countdown timers reach zero, our party members will start to die. So this is a very dangerous situation that we've arrived in. If we run out the timers, well, our entire party could get wiped out. So what we need to do is use our most powerful attacks and magic. We're going to have Kane jump, we're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut, and we're going to have Rosa use White. Cecil and Edge will use melee attacks, and all combined we should be able to deal the 28,000 damage required to defeat this boss before our party runs out of time. Now when the counters do start to run out, they don't all run out at the exact same time, that's how you'd think it would work, but it doesn't seem to work that way. So you may be able to revive one of your characters before the entire party gets wiped out. But that's more of a backup strategy. You really just want to be able to defeat Plague before the counters reach zero. The White Spear is a somewhat underwhelming ultimate weapon for a melee character with only 109 attack but it does add holy damage, which can be useful, and it can cast the spell of white for free when used as an item in battle. And before we can collect the treasure in this room, we'll need to face another boss, a pair of D Lunars. These two bosses are guarding a very good pair of items, but they're actually very easy to defeat. Many of the strategies that worked against the D bones and the D fossils will work here. We should start off the battle by having Edge use his Flame Blitz. Then we're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut. That will deal a ton of damage. Cecil should attack with his Crystal Sword, which has a holy attack and should deal maximum damage to either dragon. And we can have Kane attack the one in the back with his Jump, and now that he has the White Spear, he should be able to deal decent damage as well. 
3200 is a little bit less than I was expecting from Kane, but Cecil is going to be able to bring us home with another swing of his crystal sword. So these D-Lunars are not that difficult to defeat. Just beat them down and use Bahamut, and you'll easily be able to collect their treasure. Cecil and Edge both leveled up that time, so we'll take a look at their status. 80 strength, that is very impressive. Edge is up to 60 strength, which is pretty good, but it certainly isn't 80. And let's have Rosa cure the party. We did take some damage during that fight. The D Lunars were protecting a pair of ribbons and ribbons are a special helmet that any character can wear and not only does it provide a decent amount of defense and magic defense but the ribbons will prevent all status ailments so anything like dark mute tiny toad piggy any of that bad stuff but you can still use berserk with a ribbon so unlike the crystal armor, a character protected by a ribbon can still be berserked, which is good if you'd like to use the berserk spell on Edge to make him more powerful in combat. I always give one of the ribbons to Rosa because it's very important that the party's healer is never afflicted by status ailments, but the second ribbon could be given to a number of other characters this time I gave it to Edge, but you may want to consider giving it to Rydia. We're going to head back to the save room so that we can save the game before moving on. We did fight two boss battles, so now is a good time to save the game just to be extra safe. But along the way we met this King Ryu, so we're going to quickly take him out by casting Bahamut and having our other characters use their melee attacks. This time Rosa leveled up, so we can take a look at her status. Let's see how Rosa is doing. She's up to 91 willpower, very good. And we're going to head back into the save room, so she won't need to use any of her magic to cure us this time. We might as well use a cabin. It's not like there's going to be another place where we can use them ahead. Heading back here to save and use a cabin is certainly optional. You may want to go a bit farther and collect some more items before coming back to do a save. But for now, we're going to continue past door 2 and 3, and this time we're going to head towards the door labeled W on the map. So we'll head up around this ridge and down the stairs. And before we can get to door W, we have to face a King Ryu and a Ging Ryu together. We're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut, and that should easily clear out both enemies. But we can have our melee attackers soften up the enemies first. That should make sure that Bahamut comes through. And Edge even made the Ging Ryu fall asleep, which is pretty good. Now, if Bahamut were to not kill the Ging Ryu, it would counterattack us, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be enough to finish it off. And maximum damage is plenty to defeat either of those enemies. So once they're out of the way, we'll continue through the door. This area just doesn't look like the moon anymore. And that's because this is not a moon. It's a space station. And over on the left side, we'll be able to find a ninja shuriken, which is a very powerful item for Edge to dart. And here's our first battle on this floor, an evil mask. Evil masks have a lot of hit points, and they start out the battle by making sure everyone has a wall on them. Then it'll start doing delta attacks, like White, Nuke, and Virus, by casting those spells on itself so that it reflects off the wall and back onto your party. So we need to either use spells that go through the wall, like Bahamut, or we can have Rosa cast her White spell on one of our party members 
so that it bounces off of their wall and hits the evil mask. Remember, a spell can only be reflected one time, so once a spell has bounced off of a wall, it will not be reflected again. Before heading down the stairs that are labeled X on the map, if we head over to the lower right corner, we can find Edge's ultimate katana blade. But before that, it looks like we've been attacked again by a single evil mask. So we're going to use the same strategy that we used previously. I want you to note that evil masks could drop the glass helmet. It's a very rare item but it protects a character very well from physical attacks. However, it doesn't provide any protection from magic, so at this point in the game, the glass helmet is not as good as you may think. Magic defense will be a lot more important as we head towards the bottom. In addition to dropping glass helms, evil masks are worth 50,000 experience points, and this time, Kane leveled up. So before we try to pick up this katana, we'll take a look at his stats, and we want to make sure that everyone is cured before we move forward, because it's about time that we faced a very dangerous boss. This is Ogo Pogo. You think that you, the ones from the blue planet, can handle this blade of black? Mass immune? Ogo Pogo is like a super leviathan. He starts out by using leviathan's trademark big wave attack twice. And that's going to deal some major damage to our entire party. After the big wave attack, you'll want to make sure that you have healed the party so that we can survive any future attacks from the boss. If Rosa spends her first turn casting Cure 4 on the entire party, it'll be almost like those big wave attacks never happened. Rydia should continuously cast Bahamut against Ogopogo. This attack will deal at least 9,000 damage if it doesn't deal maximum damage. Ogo Pogo will counter most magic with a blaze attack that hits the entire party, but it doesn't hit for very much damage. If Rosa's not worried about curing the party, she can use her white spell to deal more damage to the boss. This boss has 37,000 hit points, so we're going to need to use everything we can to beat this guy. One thing we should not use against this boss are lightning spells. Ogo Pogo will counter lightning magic with a weak spell, and that will put a character at critical health. Then either a big wave or even a blaze counterattack will easily kill that character off, so having your characters weakened is a recipe for disaster. There isn't much in this game that can survive a double blast from Bahamut, and this time Rydia leveled up. We were able to get the Mazamune, which is an amazing weapon for Edge. It only adds plus 65 to his attack, but he can equip two weapons. It adds plus 3 to agility, so you know we like that. And you may want to consider equipping the Cat Claw with the Mazamune, or you could equip both the Mazamune and the Murasame. With the Cat Claw and the Mazamune, Edge is insanely fast with 53 agility, so I think that's my preferred configuration. You can also use the Mazamune as an item in battle to cast the spell of Fast for free, and that is a very amazing ability for a weapon to have. The Mazamune is the last of the ultimate weapons that we're going to find in this dungeon, and once you've collected it, I highly recommend going back to the save point where we'll be able to use the cabin and save the game. If we were to die anywhere moving forward, we would have to face that boss again, so I think it's a good idea to save the game before we try to move on. Even if you went on to beat the game after finding the Mazamune, 
you're not going to have another opportunity to save without going back to this save point. So after winning, if you wanted to play the game again, you would have to fight that boss another time if you wanted Edge to have the Mazimune. So that's why I think it's a good idea to save, but that's the last time we're going to be going back to the save point. From here on out, it's the direct road to Zemus. So for one last time, we'll head down these stairs, but before we can go through the door, we'll have to remove one more King Ryu. We just got that mass immune for Edge, so we'll see if he can get an attack in. But if Rydia's Bahamut goes off first, we know that the King Ryu will not stand a chance. So we'll see what happens. We'll have Cecil attack just in case, and here's that Bahamut spell, which will easily win the battle. We'll have to try out that mass immune on another enemy. And we'll get our experience points. We're not super worried about the gold at this point. There are no more stores moving forward, so there's no way for us to spend the money. And here we are in the depths of the lunar subterrain. So we're just going to crisscross around the floors and we're going to make our way to the stairway that's labeled X on the map. That will bring us down deeper. On this floor, there are a couple of treasure chests, but none of them are super important. An elixir is a good item to find, but it's nothing that we need. And down at the bottom, we'll be able to find a whistle that we can use to summon the fat chocobo. But first, we'll have to fight another evil mask. There are other monsters that you could encounter on this floor, like a red dragon or a behemoth, but we've seen those enemies before as well. Just like we have previously, we're going to let Rydia cast Bahamut, which goes right through the enemy's wall, and we're going to have Rosa cast White on one of our own party members so that it will reflect off of the wall that the Evil Mask put on him, and it will go back at the Evil Mask itself. So here comes our Delta Attacked White spell, It'll bounce off of Cecil's wall, and it will deal 8,993 damage to the evil mask, finishing it off. And Rosa gained a level. Nice work, Rosa. So we can take a look at her status. We'll see how Rosa's coming along. Up to 92 willpower now. She just keeps getting more and more willful. And down here, we'll be able to round the corner, and here's a different monster, a red dragon. Of course, we've seen red dragons protecting treasure chests before, but here's one all by itself. These guys are weak against ice magic, so we can have Rydia cast ice 3 to deal a ton of damage. The roughly 10,000 damage that Rydia will be able to deal with her ice 3 spell will complement our melee attacks, and easily add up to the 15,000 damage that we need to defeat this monster. Although it did deal some decent damage to Rydia, we're going to have to cure her between fights. So we'll have Rosa take care of that. She's going to use her Cure 1 magic. With the benefit of her 92 willpower, even her weaker Cure 1 magic is very effective when used outside of battle and it's our most efficient way to cure. Down here, we'll find that whistle, so if we need to summon the fat chocobo, we can do that. And here, we have the other enemy that you can meet on this floor, the good old behemoth. Most of the behemoths that we've seen so far have either been guarding treasure chests or certain areas on the ground, but this is a free roaming behemoth that we've met as a random monster encounter. It doesn't make any difference though, we're going to use the same strategy. Have Edge cast Image, have Rosa cast Blink on Cecil, and we can try out the Mass Immune as an item to speed up Rosa so that she'll be able to cast more Blink spells quickly. 
So that's a free way of doing that. And really, Edge doesn't have a whole lot to do while we're waiting for Rosa to put up the blink shields, so he might as well use the Mazamune to speed up the process. So that's really the only thing that we're going to do differently this time. We sped up Rosa using the Mazamune. The rest of the strategy is going to remain the same. We'll try to keep those blink shields up, and we'll have our melee attack characters deal all of the damage, because behemoths are very strong against magic damage. And that's a pretty powerful attack from Edge, which will finish the fight, and we'll be able to grab our 11,000 plus experience points, and Kane gained a level. So we can take a look at his status. He's up to 67 strength with 52 vitality. Very powerful. And we're going to cure the party before we move forward, but we are very close to the teleporter that will lead us down to the next floor. We are so close to the end now. There are some different monster configurations on this floor, but we drew the most common one, a single behemoth. So this should be very easy for us to defeat, but we may have to fight two behemoths at the same time on this floor, in which case we would just use the same strategy, it would only take longer. Or we may have to fight three red dragons, that would be pretty scary. Or maybe a red dragon and a behemoth together. So there are definitely some dangerous encounters on this floor, but I would not say that this is one of them. If you don't feel like fighting some of these longer battles, you could just run away, but we are trying to build up some last minute levels before we fight the final boss, and these enemies are fairly easy and worth a lot of experience points. So now's a good time to keep fighting the enemies, and we should be able to level up at least a few more times before we get to the end. Also be aware that if you want to run away from the enemies in this area, you might take a few hits before your party escapes, so it may be faster to have Edge use his smoke spell. Something to keep in mind. Whenever you see a behemoth like this, we're going to fight it because we want those experience points, and this time Ridia was the one that gained a level. So we can take a look at Ridia's status. She's up to level 52, and we're hoping for levels that are at least in the 50s when we're fighting the boss. Levels over 55 should almost guarantee a victory. So if we can get up to that high of a level, we should be in good shape. We'll head down here and we'll pick up this chest which contains some more ninja shurikens. We may find a use for them in the final battle. And here we have two evil masks. This is a little bit more interesting. When there was only one evil mask for us to fight, it didn't have enough time to get off any of its dangerous spells. Most of the time, the evil mask would just start casting walls and by the time it was done, it would be dead. This time, on the other hand, there's two evil masks, so there's going to be a very good chance that at least one of these is going to be able to cast white and maybe even nuke. So we want to concentrate all of our attacks on one of the two masks, the one in the front. We will have Rydia cast Bahamut, which will deal big damage to both masks, and we're going to have Rosa bounce a white spell off of one of our characters, and we don't know where that's going to land. It's random as to which evil mask it will hit. And here's the evil mask's first spell. It did white against Cecil, which did hurt pretty bad. And the other evil mask will probably do that as well if Rydia hadn't cast her second Bahamut spell which I think is going to end the battle, and it does. And we gained 20,000 experience points each, which is enough for Edge to gain a level. So we'll take a look at Edge's stats. He's not equipped with the Murasame now, which is costing him some points of strength, but he has some agility to make up for it. 54 agility at that, making him our fastest character by far. 
Rosa can cure the party. And over on the left side, we can find another chest, but first, we have to face the combination of a red D and a behemoth. Now, you've seen both of these enemies before, you can probably figure out what we need to do. We need to focus everything on the red D, because the behemoth is essentially harmless. We can still have Rosa start to cast the blink shields, but we really need to make sure that we get rid of that red dragon, because that's the guy that can hurt us. Once the red dragon's out of the way, we can use our normal behemoth strategy to get rid of the final monster. We'll have Rydia cast Ice 3 on the red dragon, and we'll focus our melee attacks on it until it's gone, and then we'll just keep our blink shields up as our characters pick off the behemoth. So this battle looks difficult at first, but if you just take it step by step, it's actually fairly simple. From here, the rest of the fight should be simple. We'll just have Cecil and Edge continue to attack. Kane will continue to jump. Rosa will make sure that our characters have their blink shields on. And Rydia will just continue to parry. Her magic doesn't really do anything against the behemoth, so she can just stay in a defensive posture, which is helpful to the team. You can see that Kane doesn't really take much damage even if he does get hit by the behemoth, so we don't have to worry about putting a blink shield on him, and it should not take much more to finish this battle. We got over 22,000 experience points each for that, and this time Cecil gained a level. So we'll take a look at his status. Cecil now has 83 strength and 70 vitality, so he is an extremely powerful tank. We'll be certainly happy to have him in our front line. Over here on the left side, we can find another ninja shuriken, and then we'll head down to the lower right corner where we'll find the next to last teleporter. So this is it, the last floor with regular enemies, and here is a breath monster for us to fight. This deep down into the final dungeon, you may be very surprised to find out that this monster is exceptionally harmless. I don't think I've ever taken damage from a breath. The only way that they can hurt you is if you use magic against them. It can do a counterattack if you use magic, so just use melee attacks and nothing bad will happen. These guys do have over 31,000 hit points, but that doesn't really matter when they don't actually fight back. We can even have Rydia attack, it doesn't matter. So just keep up the beatdown, and eventually this thing will die, and we'll be able to collect its 60,000 experience points, which seems like a steal considering how easy this thing is. If you feel like you're behind on levels at this point in the game, farming the breath enemies that you can encounter on this floor can certainly get you the experience points you need to succeed. You just need to watch out for the mind enemies. They have a lot fewer hit points, but those ones are actually dangerous. And if you're under leveled, you should just run away anytime that you see a mind. Whenever you do finally defeat a breath, it will die in a very dramatic fashion. So yeah, you have to wait for it to fade away like it was some kind of boss, and then you can finally collect your reward. And that's what you should do if you encounter breaths. Just defeat them, and you'll be able to gain a bunch of experience points. This time, Rosa gained a level. So let's see how many willpower she has now. 93. Very good. So we're going to head across, down, and then back over to the right. There are no treasure chests to find on this floor. And it looks like we hit another breath, which is very lucky. We know what to do against these harmless monsters, so I'm just going to speed through this fight. 
Of course, these enemies have a ton of hit points, so it takes a long time to get through these battles, but it is worth it for the experience points that you'll receive. So, once we finally chip away at this guy, don't use any magic, we'll be able to get our 12,000 experience points, and no one leveled up that time, which is a little bit disappointing. We'll head down this stairway and cut across to the left. If we can make it through this teleporter, we will be in the final room. But before we go on to the final boss, I will show you what to do if you have to fight a mind. The danger with the mind enemies is that after a few turns, it's going to attempt to charm all of your party members, and it's unlikely that every member of your party will have protection from that, so a couple of them will probably succumb to the confusion. Confused party members can wreak havoc on our team, and melee attacks don't work very well against mines, so we need to use our most powerful magic. Have Rydia cast Nuke, have Rosa cast White, and if we're lucky we'll be able to deal enough damage that the mind will die before our confused characters can do anything too awful. The safest way to deal with mines is probably to just run away. You should be able to escape before your characters become confused. And with that bit of business out of the way, let's get back to the final boss. Before we face Zemus, let's use a whistle and see what the big chocobo is holding for us. Make sure to get back the spoon if you have it. We will definitely want to use that. Also grab any shurikens that you have and any other weapons that you might want to dart. So we'll get rid of some items that we're not going to use, a bunch of armor that's not currently equipped, and we want to take any weapons that we think we might throw at this final boss. So grab the spoon, grab shurikens, grab the avenger sword, although we probably won't be throwing that, but just in case. And once you have all the items that you want from the big chocobo, make sure to go into your inventory and sort them so that you know where they are whenever you're in the heat of battle. This could be a tough one, so you want to make sure that you are fully prepared. So we'll make sure that our items are sorted and we have the spoon ready to go. We also want to make sure that we have access to elixirs, our shurikens, the ninja shurikens, and anything else that we might want to use. So we'll move some things around here and get our affairs in order, because once we get to the top of the stairs, there will be no going back. We'll see a short scene before we fight the boss, and here it is. Before we have a chance to fight Zemus ourselves, Golbez and Fusoya take a crack at him, and they do a pretty good job. Golbez starts out with a Fire 3 spell, Fusoya follows it up with Slow Magic, and Golbez continues with Ice 3. These magics don't seem to deal a lot of damage to the boss, but that's because when you're watching a cutscene, Spells only deal their base damage, and they are not increased by any Wisdom or Willpower modifiers. With a quick glance, Golbez and Fusoya synchronize their motions. Together, they cast the ultimate spell, Double Meteo. Take notes, Palamemporum. If you two study hard enough, you may be able to figure out how to cast that one. Zemus seems to be defeated, but his final words are ominous. He says, This is just the beginning. But once he fades away, Golbez and Fusoya celebrate. It seems like a job well done. Zemus falls fat on his face with a loud splat. That looked painful. Edge shouts out, right on, and a celebration breaks out. 
Golbez and Fusoya are surprised to see that we're here. Ah, uh, yeah, we made it through. Edge is disappointed that he was unable to kill Zemus, but he may still have a chance. Because we all know a video game end boss can't be killed that easily. That was just its first form. Zemus's corpse bursts into flames. I am the absolute dark substance, a product of Zemus's hatred. My name is Zero Miss. I am the hatred. And with a bolt of lightning, our party is struck down. But Fusoya and Golbez are still on their feet. Golbez promises to cast Zero Miss back where he belongs, and a battle breaks out. This time, Zero Miss looks like some sort of blue furball, and he's a lot smaller this time. But don't let that fool you, he is much more powerful now. Golbez and Fusoya use Meteo against the boss, but it heals him. I'm really not sure why they cast it the second time. Golbez attempts to use the crystal, but since his heart is tainted with evil, the crystal is ineffective. If I recall correctly, there were about 16 crystals before, so I'm not sure why it seems like there's only one now. But in any case, Zero Mist quickly ends the fight with a Meteo spell of his own. With our entire party lying dead at his feet, Zero Mist can't help himself. He goes into an evil rant, and everything fades to black. When it seems like all hope is lost, we suddenly see a scene in the Tower of Wishing. Somehow, Palum and Porum have sensed that our party is in danger. All right, everyone, now is the time. We need to pray, er, wish as hard as we can. So everyone, wish with all of your heart and send those wishes to the moon. Think about Cecil, Rosa, Rydia, Edge, and if you have time, even Cain. They need our help now. All right, Moon. This is the time. Answer our wish and hear our prayers. And that day, the people of Earth wished harder than they had ever wished before. And the Moon answered their wish. With a newfound energy, Cecil woke up. He wandered over to his brother Golbez, who handed him the crystal, the key to defeating Zeromis. Zeromis, for all those living on Earth, I will destroy you. In front of an epic background of moving stars, we hear the prayers from the people of Earth. Palam and Porum are first, and they grant us the vitality that revives the remaining members of our party. Next, we see our good friend Edward, and who's that with him? It's Tella, back from the dead, but just for now. Tella's return here just proves that nobody truly ever dies in this game, and from them, we receive the energy. After Edward and Tella, we get to see Yong and Sid. Well, at least these two are alive. Yong tells us to concentrate, which I think is a reference to one of his abilities in the original Japanese version that was removed for this version of the game. That ability, which is sometimes called focus, will allow Yong to double his power, but it takes a lot of time to use. And once those two fade out, our entire party is almost completely restored, but there's one more pair to see. Golbez and Fusoya. Fusoya says to bless him, Moon, and with that, our entire party is revived. Golbez gives us one last clue. My dear brother, he says, 
Let your sacred power be with the crystal. So that's what we need to do here. We need to have Cecil use the crystal from his item menu. The boss won't damage us during this phase, and I used to think that we should use this time to cast buff spells on our party, but the boss will immediately dispel any buffing that we do, so it's just a waste of time. You won't be able to get any benefits from buffs like Fast or Berserk until after the boss transforms. So wait for Cecil's turn, just have everyone else parry, and then he can use the crystal, which will transform Zero Miss into his true form. Once you use the crystal, it's go time. His true colors emerged. So put your best face on, everybody. Come hang. Let's go out with a bang. The first thing that I'm going to do is have Edge use the Mazamune on Rosa so that she will get the benefits of the fast spell for free. The boss will eventually dispel that, but at least here in the beginning she'll be sped up. In the first phase of the fight, we're going to have Rosa speed up a few of our other characters, we're going to have Rydia cast Bahamut, and we're going to have Edge dart our best items, starting with the Spoon. The Spoon will always deal maximum damage to this guy, so that's a great way to get things going. Bahamut also deals a lot of damage to the boss, but it's a little bit risky because Zero Miss will counter with a nuke spell, and later on in the battle, he'll counter by casting Virus on the entire party. Nuke is not that bad, but the Virus attack is dangerous, and here's Zero Miss's signature attack, which is called Big Bang. Big Bang will deal big damage to our party, and that's why Rosa is the focus of this fight. She can use her Cure 4 to restore the party, and rescue us from the Big Bang. One thing that we should never do against Zero Miss is cast the White Spell. The White Spell will deal a ton of damage, but he will counter by casting Weak on one of our party members, and if he hits Rosa with it, that could be a total disaster. The good news is that Zero Miss doesn't ever heal itself, so any damage that's been dealt to this boss will stay on it forever, and it does not counter physical attacks. If you see it shaking like that, that means it's about to use its big bang attack, and if you happen to have Rosa's turn, you should wait until it actually casts big bang, and then immediately use cure 4 on the entire party. That will allow time for the big bang to deal damage, and she should cast Cure 4 almost immediately afterwards, completely nullifying the effect of the opposing spell. As the battle progresses, Zero Miss will add a few other attacks to its script, including this one called Black Hole. Black Hole luckily doesn't deal any damage to the party, it just dispels any magic effects that you had going, like Berserk or Fast so you would have to cast those spells again to get those effects going, but at this point in the battle you shouldn't even worry about it. Don't worry about buffing your party because the boss will probably just use Black Hole again, and you'll be in the same situation you were before. Instead, focus on having Rosa cure the party, and everyone else should be dealing damage. If Rosa dies, that is a Class A emergency, and you should stop everything that you're doing and immediately try to revive her and quickly follow it up with an elixir so that she will be back to full health. So do not let Rosa go down. However, if Rydia were to die, that's not as big of a deal. Unfortunately, Rydia is kind of fragile, and her powerful Bahamut spell will get countered by the boss, so she's a little bit less important. 
if there are fewer characters left on your side of the board, whenever Rosa uses her Cure 4, it will restore more hit points to each remaining character, so losing one member of your team isn't really that bad. If Cecil or Kane dies, you can have Rosa revive them with life too, but in my experience, if Cecil or Kane dies, you probably have some bigger problems to deal with because they have the most hit points, and if they are dying, then the rest of your party is probably already dead. We took a lot of damage from that last big bang attack, but with just one casting of Cure 4, our entire team is healthy again. One other thing you need to be careful about is to make sure that Rosa never runs out of magic, just have one of your other characters throw an elixir on her, and whenever Zero Mist starts casting Meteo, you'll know that you've won. The boss's Meteo spell is very weak at this point in the fight, and that just indicates that he is extremely low on health. And with a few more attacks, you'll be able to see Zero Miss's extremely dramatic death scene. And I'm not kidding about it being extremely dramatic. I think it may take almost an entire minute for this guy to go down. And that's it! We've done it! We've beaten Final Fantasy 2 or 4 or whichever number you'd like to assign to it. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. Or maybe there's still one last thing. Before we get to the ending, and it is quite an ending, let's talk about the dark matter. So there's still one more treasure that you could potentially find if you were playing the original Japanese version or some of the other later versions of the game. Here on the Super Nintendo version, if you use Edge's sneak ability on any form of the final boss, you'll either have a failure or you'll be able to find an elixir. And you can find a whole stockpile of elixirs if you're very lucky. Being a higher level character will increase your chances of success whenever you use Edge's sneak ability. So no matter how many times you try to sneak an item from this boss in this version of the game, you will never find the dark matter. So what's the deal with this dark matter thing anyways? Well, in the original Japanese version, if you sneak an item from this boss, you may be able to find the dark matter and here it is in the translated version. So you can see it in action. There's a very good chance that you'll get a failure message when you try to sneak an item from this boss, but if you're lucky enough, you can find a dark matter, or you can find many dark matters. This item doesn't actually do anything. It's just another item for you to find, and many people used to believe that it would make the Big Bang attack deal less damage to the party if you had a Dark Matter in your inventory, but no, it does not actually do that. On some of the later versions of the game, the Dark Matter does have a purpose, but here on the Super Nintendo, it doesn't do anything. So we got the Dark Matter that time, and you can see it in our inventory. There is no way to use it, and it does not decrease the damage of the Big Bang attack. So getting the Dark Matter is just for fun. As an earthquake shakes the core of the moon, Zero Mist takes his final breath. His last words... I will not perish as long as there is evil in the hearts of people are certainly ominous, but they don't seem to have much meaning right now. Somehow lightning strikes the inside of the moon and everything shakes. Then, as quickly as the flame appeared, 
it burns out and fades away. Fusoya is impressed. Yeah, maybe us humans aren't as backwards as you may have thought. But then, of course, I do have the dragon's blood coursing through my veins. Zero Miss's last words were weighing heavily in our minds, but Fusoya was able to put that to rest. Evil in our minds will never disappear. Just as there are crystals of light and darkness, so long as evil exists, so does good. I'd like to think that after we defeated Zemus, evil would be gone forever, but of course evil would never truly go away. Still, for now, at least there would be peace. Fusoya says that he must now return to his sleep. With Zero Mist defeated, his help is no longer needed. But before Fusoya can walk away, Golbez rushes to his side. Can I go with you, he asks. It seems that after all of the terrible things he had done on Earth, there's just no way that he can go back. Golbez thanks Cecil for calling him brother, but upon hearing that Golbez is going to leave, Cecil is absolutely devastated. He understands that Golbez has committed so many atrocities that he can never return to Earth, but after losing his adoptive father and getting burned by his best friend Cain, Cecil yearned desperately to connect with his brother. Although the two brothers had barely ever talked, the two shared some sort of unspoken code. So we know that when Cecil said goodbye that day, Golbez knew that he meant, I love you. So long, Golbez. My brother. And as everything fades out, we're taken to a scene of the solar system. The earth revolves around the sun, and the moons revolve around the earth, just as they always have. It kind of looks like there's three moons now, but I think one of those might actually be Venus. Or maybe Mercury? It's kind of hard to tell. As we stare directly into the sun, we are reminded once more of the Mycidian legend. One to be born from a dragon, hoisting the light and the dark, arises high up in the sky to the still land, veiling the moon with the light of eternity it brings another promise to Mother Earth with a bounty and mercy. The moon has just started to seek for its own light. Yep, it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We'll watch as the Earth goes around the sun one more time, and then we'll finally fade away from this scene and return back to good old planet Earth. So there it goes in the background, swirling through the stars. All right, enough of this already. Let's get to the good stuff. And as we return to Earth, it seems that our spaceship is going back under the water, so I certainly hope that we all got out of there in time. It would have been nice to keep that around, though. A spaceship is a very cool thing to own. Although I suppose if we ever wanted another one, we could always just wish for it. Back in Mesidia, life has returned to normal. Palam and Porum are ready for their lesson with the Elder, or at least Porum is. Palam's outside trying to impress a girl with tales of his adventures. To be fair to the guy, at least the story that he's telling is true. Porum shows up and chastises him for missing his lessons by giving him a bonk on the head. Enough of your boasting, the Elder is waiting for you. 
Yeah, Purim. If you don't study, how will you ever learn how to cast double medio? Back inside, the elder has a special punishment for Purim. How many times do I have to tell you not to skip lessons? Here's your homework. Brutal. Palum begs for the elder to show mercy, but deep down inside, he knows it's fair. Over in the ruins of Eblan Castle, Edge has taken over the throne. Chamberlain is not super excited about this recent development and feels like Edge is too distracted by dating women to handle his responsibilities to the throne. Chamberlain may have a point. The Kingdom of Ebland was in pretty bad shape. The castle was in ruins, the people were living underground, everyone was starving. I certainly hope Edge has everyone's best interests in mind. Edge seems to be hopelessly infatuated with Rydia, but I have bad news for you, bro. I'm not sure that Rydia's into human guys. She might be more interested in monster types. Just saying. Speaking of Rydia, she's gone back to the village of monsters. I certainly hope she doesn't stay here for too long, or the next time we meet her, she might be like a thousand years old. A baby monster asks, Why don't you have any fangs like us, Rydia? Are we different? And she reassures him, Come on, there's nothing different between us. Because now at the end of the game is a perfect time to remind us that the monsters we've been killing the entire time are just like regular people, and they have normal lives. But I guess the heart is what's important. Right, Cecil? But instead of going to Cecil next, we return to the Kingdom of Fable, where the king has abdicated the throne to Yong. So now Yong and his wife are king and queen. Pretty cool. This castle was blasted by the Red Wings and pillaged from the inside, so there's a lot of rebuilding to be done. But under the guidance of Yong, I think that the people of Fable are in good hands. Well, assuming that he does something about those allergies, get a Zyrtec or something, Yong. As the Karate Men head off for their training, the former king assures us that Yong will rebuild a fabulous fable. And from here, we head to the castle of Dom Kayan and Edward. At first, Edward seems to be just strolling around his castle, and the people here still call him Prince Edward, although I think at this point he's gotta be king, right? Did they not do a ceremony or something? But then, three children surround him. Are these his kids? Did Anna give birth to triplets? Wow, that makes so much sense. No wonder she was running away with him. I don't know, Tella. I think you might have been a little bit too hard on this guy. If Anna was pregnant, then Edward was just trying to be a responsible father. And I don't care who you are. Being a proper father to triplets takes some serious courage. He takes a moment to speak to Anna. I hope Tella will keep you company. And then we return to the Dwarven Castle and King Geot. The people here seem to be in good spirits as they rebuild the castle. They've probably all been drinking from that communal water bucket. Unfortunately, it seems like there may not be enough materials to complete the construction, but King Geod has an idea. We can scrap the tanks because there won't be another war. Well, I mean, that's extremely optimistic, but I guess that'll work for now. After a bit of celebration from the King's proclamation of world peace, Luca wonders what Cecil and the others are doing. Well, it seems that King Geot has received good news. Cecil will ascend the Baronian throne, and Rosa will be his queen. Not only that, but they're all invited to the ceremony. It's at this point that one of the king's subjects calls him out for being lazy, 
And so it's back to business. Scrap the tanks. And with a lolly ho, we fade away from the Dwarven castle and we find Kane on Mount Ordeals. Did you know Kane had long blonde hair like Fabio? Yeah, he must keep it jammed up in that helmet, which he never seems to take off like he's the Mandalorian or something. Kane does not feel good about the way he was manipulated by Zemus, so he's climbing Mount Ordeals to become a true dragoon before coming back. Suddenly, we are returned to the village of Agart and the Space Observatory. It seems that something is going on with the moon, or at least one of the moons. The scientists here seem pretty excited, but what's happening in outer space would be downright alarming. It seems that the moon has gone rogue and is going to escape the Earth's orbit. I feel like that could be catastrophic, but hey, who am I to say? So we'll just watch the planet spin around the sun one more time and we'll be able to observe this strange cosmic phenomenon. Although I'm not sure where this perspective comes from, obviously we are not looking at this scene from a telescope on the Earth itself. This is like the perspective from Mars or something. And there it is. In a feat that totally defies physics, the moon goes flying off into the distance. See you later, moon. And so if you've ever been wondering, that is why there's only one moon. The other one just flew away at some point. Back in Cecil's room in the castle of Baron, it seems that they've spruced up the place with some flowers and can you believe it? They got a second bed. Yep, that's how you know that you've really made it in this world. Cecil says that he heard his brother's voice, but when Rosa asks him more about it, he just says, never mind. Sid pops up in the stairway and says that everyone is downstairs waiting for us. Rosa apologizes, and he says we'll have plenty of time later to spend together. Sid addresses Rosa as queen, but she doesn't like the formality of that. Rosa is fine. Well, the bride needs makeup and the maids are waiting, so everyone needs to hurry up. Rosa complies, and with a twirl, Sid walks away. Everyone is about to arrive and Rosa is very excited. She tells Cecil to hurry before she too heads down the stairs. But Cecil did hear his brother that day, and he said goodbye. I love you too, brother sleep well. And now it's time for the royal wedding. Unlike your typical wedding, it seems that the bride and the groom are already in the room when the guests start showing up. So yeah, that's a little bit different. And they each start filing in and forming lines on the left and right sides. Sid and Ed show up first, followed by King Giot and his daughter Luca. After a few twirls, they fall into line on the right side. Then Yong shows up, and it looks like Yong didn't get a plus one? We couldn't be bothered to invite his wife? I mean, she was instrumental in our success. She gave us the spoon. Well, in any case, Palam and Porum follow, and the elder from Mesidia was invited, but Yong's wife wasn't? That is a pretty big snub. Edward arrives next, and I guess this was a no kids kind of party, so he comes in alone. Did you know that in the original Japanese version, his name was Gilbert? Very strange. When Rydia shows up, Edge turns his back to her. I guess that's his way of flirting? I'm not sure if it's going to work for Edge, but it did seem to get Rydia's attention. And that's it. As all of the characters turn to face forward, they acknowledge the new King of Baron. Long live Cecil Harvey! 
The king with the dragon's blood. And Cecil would become a great ruler. For generations to come, children would be told stories of the purple-haired king that saved the human race from extinction. The legends would tell how he came down from the cosmos with his crystal sword and had hatched from a dragon's egg. Roll the credits. Wow, what an incredible game. I want to thank all of you that have been with me for this entire journey. Thanks for coming along. As a kid, this was one of the first RPGs that I had ever completed. I had finished the first Dragon Warrior, but Final Fantasy II was just so much more complex. I had played the first Final Fantasy, but that game was hard and I wasn't able to beat it until I was a little bit older. This one, though, was perfect for a kid like me. Being able to finish this game gave me the confidence to try more difficult and more complex games, so in a lot of ways, this was like a gateway to other RPGs. And I don't think I'm the only one that feels that way. I feel like there are a ton of people out there that found RPGs through this game, and what's particularly ironic about that is that the original developers had intended to make a game that was completely the opposite, something that was not for beginners, but was actually designed for experienced veterans of the genre. And one of the more interesting things that I learned while researching this video is that the version we got here in North America is not the same as the original Japanese version or the easy type that they made later. For most of my life, I thought that they just translated easy type, and that's the version that we got, but it's not exactly that. If you look at the monster stats, across the board they're more similar to the ones on easy type, but later in the game, you'll notice that some of them are actually exactly the same as the Japanese versions, and there are even some bosses that have unique stats for the North American version, like Ogo Pogo or the final boss. The final boss doesn't even look the same on easy type. He looks like some kind of pirate lobster, so that's a really big difference. I'd like to take this moment to once again thank the members of the You Can Beat Video Games Patreon, especially the ones that recommended some of the tricks that actually appeared in this video series. It wouldn't have been as good without you. I'd also like to thank my wife, who took the time to key in all of the monster stats. So that was a lot of work. Thank you so much. Before we go, Squaresoft wanted to give us one more Mode 7 effect. This looks pretty cheesy by modern standards, but back in the 1990s, this was pretty cool. So it just spins forward, and then we see the words, THE END. Although we know it's not really the end, because there will be Final Fantasy The After Years later. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Final Fantasy II, restoring world peace presumably for all of eternity. If it did, make sure to give it a like, and make sure to subscribe for more videos. Because as long as evil exists, so does good. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.